Good morning. This is a hearing of the Committee of Agriculture entitled Renegotiate NAFTA. Opportunities for Agriculture will come to order. I've asked uh, G.T. Thompson to uh, offer up a prayer. G.T. Thank you, Chairman. Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for this uh, blessed day, the, the rest of the night, and, um, and this new day morning, Lord. We, we come together as uh, individuals who share a passion and commitment for, uh, for agriculture, for rural America, and what rural America provides to uh, all of America and much of the world. And so, Lord, we just ask your blessings over those proceedings. Uh, we gather here uh, as... Uh, uh, to celebrate all the blessings that you have given us in terms of um, uh, access to bountiful, um, affordable food and and uh, clothing materials and building materials and energy, all the things that uh, resources that you have blessed us with and, and charged us to utilize. And so uh, just ask your blessings over these proceedings and uh, I ask this in the name of my Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, GT. I uh, want to start by welcoming our, welcoming our witnesses today. Thank you for taking your time out of your schedules to share your thoughts with us today. As we noted uh, often, American farmers and ranchers are most efficient, productive, and competitive producers in the world. Their ability to meet the ra rapid, uh, rapidly growing and ever-changing demands at both at home and abroad has allowed our country to become one of the world's most open agricultural economies, supplying our trading partners with a safe and affordable food and fiber supply. These trade relationships have become an essential part of the U.S. agriculture industry, and nowhere is trade more important than our relationships with our neighbors to the north and south. For more than 20 years, NAFTA has governed trade among our three countries, and in that time, U.S. agriculture exports to Canada and Mexico have nearly quadrupled. Both countries have remained essential trading partners for the U.S., accounting for roughly 28 percent of the total U.S. agricultural trade. While Canada and Mexico regularly are two of our top three export destinations for uh, agricultural products, they also remain the United States' largest suppliers of agricultural inputs. In 2016, while the U.S. continued to run an overall trade surplus in agriculture, we managed to run a trade imbalance with both Mexico and, and Canada, totaling over $6 billion. So a lot has changed since 1994 agreement was signed. All three economies are much larger, and production agriculture has evolved and improved, growing to meet ever-changing consumer demands and technological advances. And it's against this backdrop that the Trump administration prepares to renegotiate the, NAP, the terms of NAFTA. I recognize there's a certain level of angst among renegotiating the terms of our agreement, but let me reiterate, we have no interest in reversing any of the production agriculture's hard-fought gains, and the administration has made it clear that it doesn't either. In fact, the recently published renegotiated objectives affirm the importance of maintaining existing reciprocal duty-free market access for agricultural goods. Whether you're focused on maintaining current market access or you're eager for prospects of expanded trade opportunities, production agriculture stands to benefit from a modernized trade agreement with our neighbors to the north and south. As always, we must stay vigilant and all work together to ensure that we achieve the best deal possible for American agriculture. And with that, I yield to the ranking member for any comments he would like to make. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I also want to welcome today the witnesses. And uh, we have a diverse group of uh, industry representatives and um, They'll share their opinions um, on changes to NAFTA. I'm uh, supportive of efforts to uh, renegotiate NAFTA, but we may need to make sure that the end result will work for agriculture. And uh, as all my producers have said, just make sure we do no harm with <laughs> whatever we end up doing. Uh, <clears throat> I'm concerned about uh, some of the issues arising with respect to uh, the agriculture exports to Mexico as a result of some of the rhetoric and uncertainty around this negotiation, but the biggest issue that I've had with NAFTA is the fact that uh, Canada has been allowed to keep, continue their supply management system for uh, dairy and poultry. And, um, you know, that when, we, when they did the original negotiation, they did not have ultra-filtered milk, and so there was no, uh, that was not protected under the agreement, and so they, you know, they, uh, this Class 7 was, um, established and uh, the market was shopped around to some of our producers and uh, even though it was a month-to-month -month thing and uh, then Canada figured out this was undermining their situation and they stopped it. Uh, so it's part of the you know problem that we've got when dealing with them with their supply management system. The biggest problem though I think is that the number three and number five largest dairy companies in the United States are now owned by Canadians. 
And one of those is a, actually a Canadian co-op. So we have a Canadian co-op that is bigger than Land O'Lakes and DFA and, and our co-ops, uh, which I'm not sure is a good thing for the long term in the United States. So this is an issue that I've raised with the um, USTR ambassador, with Secretary Ross. Uh, they're both aware of what's going on, and uh, they said they would work to address it. But, you know, the last couple months I've met with the Canadians, um, both um, government of, um, higher officials and some of the Ag Committee people, and uh, given their response, I'm not holding my breath. So I hope that uh, in this negotiation we can get some kind of a um, path to get this supply management thing um, uh, so that we've got a um, you know, level playing field with Canadians. So our farmers uh, need a good deal, and um, that's why we're here to listen to the testimony today. Uh, and I hope that uh, everybody's listening, especially the administration, uh, as we begin negotiating NAFTA and uh, that, again, whatever we end up doing, we don't do any harm to the markets that we've been able to establish. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Now I'd like to welcome our witnesses to, the, uh, to our hearing this morning. First off, we have the Honorable Tom Vilsack, President and CEO of U.S. Dairy Export Council, uh, Arlington, uh, Virginia. Mr. Secretary, welcome back. Should be a little bit different to you this morning than we've been to you in the past. Uh, Mr. Kendall Frazier, who's Chief Executive Officer of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, Centennial, Colorado. Mr. Kevin Brosh, who's the uh, president, uh, excuse me, principal, uh, Brosh Trade LLC, Woodville, Virginia. He's here on behalf of the National Chicken Council, the National Turkey Federation, and the U.S. Poultry and Egg Export Council. Mr. Floyd Gabler, uh, Director, Trade Policy and Biotechnology, U.S. Grains Council here in Washington. Mr. Thomas Hammer, who's the president, National Oilseed Producers Association in uh, D.C., and Mr. Reggie Brown, who's the executive vice president, Florida Tomato Growers Exchange, uh, Maitland, Florida, on behalf of the Florida Fruit and Vegetable Association. Again, gentlemen, thank you for being here. Mr. Vilsack, Secretary Vilsack, uh, when you're ready. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you and the ranking member of the committee for the opportunity to be here today uh, on behalf of the nearly 42,000 dairy operators uh, in the United States, the 1,300 plants that process dairy products, and the over 100,000 employees that are employed as a result of ag exports, providing a safe, stable, and sustainably produced supply of dairy products. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to emphasize the importance of exports to the dairy industry. Uh, since 1994, uh, we've seen an increase of $36 billion uh, to the bottom line for producers and processors as a result of exports. It's added about $1.25 per hundredweight, and one out of every seven tankers today on the road is headed to an export market. So it is important for us to focus on trade, and we appreciate the opportunity to comment about the renegotiation and modernization of NAFTA. We think this offers an opportunity to preserve what's working in NAFTA to strengthen uh, what can be uh, better uh, and to fix uh, what is currently not working with our trade relationships with Mexico and Canada. Let me talk briefly about all three. We need to preserve the reciprocal duty-free market access and opportunity that is presented uh, as a result of NAFTA. We've seen the benefit of that, particularly in the Mexican market. Nearly one-third of all of our dairy exports uh, uh, go to Mexico. It now represents 73% uh, of all of the imported dairy products that go into Mexico come from the U.S. It's an amazing opportunity for us that can grow over time. We need to strengthen uh, the SBS provisions uh, of NAFTA to ensure that science-based rules continue to be established in a transparent way. Uh, we need to focus on rules of origin, and we need to strengthen the geographic indications provisions protecting the use of common names, uh, particularly for cheese products. And finally, we need to fix, Mr. Chairman, uh, the trade distorting practices that have been implemented by Canada to protect uh, their supply management and their market opportunities. Uh, this offers an opportunity and a capacity to enact policies and regulations uh, that will encourage and not inhibit imports from the U.S. The most recent example of Canadian action is the adoption of Class 6 and Class 7, which has created a, a serious problem in our dairy industry. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity to be back here. Uh, I look forward to the questions from the committee, and I yield the balance of my time. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Ms. Frazier, five minutes. Mr. Frazier, five minutes. Good morning. My name is Kendall Frazier, and I'm the CEO of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, the oldest and largest national association of cattlemen. I'm honored to provide you with our perspective on the importance of the North American Free Trade Agreement and the risk we face if the U.S. beef industry is saddled with changes to NAFTA 
that may jeopardize our current access to Canada and Mexico. According to USDA, the U.S. beef industry consists today of around 900,000 cattle and calf operations, a national herd size of about 100 million head of cattle, accounting for roughly 67.5 billion in annual farm gate receipts. In 2016, our industry sold over 6.3 billion in beef products around the world, with exports alone accounting for over $300 per head for every fed steer and heifer. NCBA strongly supports NAFTA because the terms of NAFTA developed Canada and Mexico into two very important export markets for U.S. beef. While there may be calls from other segments of agriculture and other industries to update or renegotiate the terms of NAFTA, we strongly encourage our negotiators to focus their efforts on those specific areas and leave alone the terms of NAFTA that have greatly benefited the U.S. beef and cattle industry. Quite frankly, it is difficult to improve upon duty-free, unlimited access to Canada and Mexico, and we are pleased to see that USTR announced its support for continued reciprocal duty-free access. Even still, our message remains the same. Please do no harm and do not jeopardize our access. On average, Canada and Mexico have been two of our top five export markets with approximately one billion each in annual sales. While Canada has been a high value market for muscle cuts, Mexico has proven to be an excellent market for things like skirts, tongues, and other cuts that Americans find less desirable. Now, opponents of NAFTA try to paint a dark picture of uneven beef trade, saying NAFTA has been our downfall for over 20 years. Opponents pin all our problems on NAFTA, but they fail to acknowledge other key factors out that our industry has faced, like a BSE case in 2003, severe drought that caused beef and cattle shortages, the strength of the U.S. dollar, and the continuation of tax policies that encourage the breakup of multi-generational cattle operations. Simply put, opponents view NAFTA as a zero-sum game and fail to consider important factors such as our incredible growth in global exports and the value that exports bring to all segments of our industry. This view is a great disservice to all producers. In addition, NCBA strongly opposes any attempts to use NAFTA as a vehicle to resurrect failed policies of the past, such as mandatory country of origin labeling, also known as COOL. COOL was a U.S. law for over six years and failed to deliver on its promises to build consumer confidence and add value to our products. Instead, COOL resulted in a long battle at the World Trade Organization with the United States facing the promise of more than one billion in retaliatory tariffs from Mexico and Canada unless COOL was repealed. Canada and Mexico still have the authority to retaliate against the United States as COOL is brought back into effect, and rest assured they will retaliate against us as necessary. <clears throat> We encourage you to build on the success that current NAFTA provisions have given U.S. beef producers. And I thank you for asking me to appear this morning. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. Uh, Mr. Brosh, did I mispronounce your name or is that close? That's, that's just fine. All right, five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Kevin Brosh. I'm a uh, a lawyer here who's been practicing international trade law in Washington with a concentration in agricultural products for about 35 years. From 1989 to 1997, I was the Deputy Assistant General Counsel at the Department of Agriculture, and I served as USDA's legal advisor during the GATT Uruguay Round negotiations and the formation of the World Trade Organization. I also supervised the legal work and participated in the original NAFTA negotiations in the early 90s. In 1997-98, I served as Special Trade Counsel to the Senate Agriculture Committee and its chairman, Dick Luger of Indiana. I'm here today on behalf of the National Chicken Council, the National Turkey Federation, USA Poultry and Egg Export Council. Between these three organizations, they represent more than 95% of all the poultry uh, produced and exported from the United States. I want to make the point initially that <clears throat> poultry is the most world competitive product that we have here in U.S. agriculture. We have no government programs. We have no government subsidies. We are number one in the world in the production of poultry. We're, we have about 20 percent uh, of the world's poultry production. We exceed China, which is number two. We are currently number one in exports of poultry. We, we, last year we pushed back ahead of Brazil once again. We export to more than 100 countries. 
We have 300,000 jobs in agriculture, and there are 1.4 million related industry jobs that are tied to uh, poultry production and poultry export. We also are one of the biggest exporters of soybeans and corn. Every time we export a six pound chicken, we are exporting 12 pounds of soybeans and corn with feathers on it. Um, so uh, we are a, a, a great um, value added um, export that assists not only the poultry producers and the poultry processors, but also our grain and uh, soybean people. NAFTA has been a godsend for US poultry. Uh, we went from almost no exports to Mexico, that's hard to believe, but before and after we had almost no exports. We now have a, more than a million metric tons of exports if you count all the poultry products, chur chicken, turkey, eggs, duck, together. Um, broiler chicken uh, exports, Mexico is our number one market, Canada is our number two market. For Turkey, Mexico is our number one market, Canada is our number three market. Mexico now represents 24% of our exports of, of broiler chicken and uh, related chicken products, Canada 16%. Uh, we've had good cooperation and relationships with both the Canadian and uh, uh, Mexican industries and with their governments. We've had ups and downs over the time, but we have managed to work through those and NAFTA has provided us with the mechanisms to do so. Our message is the same as our colleagues from the beef industry, please do no harm. This is a critical industry for um, the United States agriculture, not only for the poultry producers, but for our grain suppliers. Um, we have lots of jobs in states that you are familiar with, uh, Arkansas and Georgia, Mississippi, North Carolina, Iowa, Minnesota, I could go on and on. Um, those jobs depend upon the continued prosperity of uh, these companies and their ability to export to markets in Mexico and Canada are the most important ones. Thank you. Jim, you back, Mr. Graber? Five minutes? Gabler, I'm sorry. Good morning, Chairman Conaway, uh, Rank Minority Member uh, Peterson, committee members. Uh, on behalf of the U.S. Grains <coughs> Council, I appreciate the opportunity to appear for this panel to provide our perspectives on uh, the economic impacts and importance of the modernization of NAFTA. The U.S. grain sector has significantly benefited from liberalized trade in the past 30 years, and the Council believes in expanding uh, excess, access to export markets will continue to drive growth in American agriculture for years to come. In no case has that been more apparent than in our trade relationship with Canada and Mexico. NAFTA has provided the trade policy basis for the most efficient and effective interregional grain and livestock value chain in the world. Rising demand for feed and food has created new opportunities for grain exports in our hemisphere, which are tariff-free thanks to NAFTA. Due to the proximity and natural logistical advantages, Mexican feed millers and livestock producers have expanded and gained significant efficiencies by utilizing a just-in-time inventory management system based on our reliable supply of U.S. grain. <clears throat> because our economies are, have grown and become so intertwined, the trade agreement, the, this trade agreement is in particular critical to our members' business, and at the last several months, uh, we've, it's highlighted how important it is to maintain our uh, relationships if we're going to continue to grow. Since March, our CEO and chairman has traveled twice to Mexico to meet with our, our customers and government officials. We also invited those same customers to the U.S. Uh, in May to meet with U.S. industry and members of U.S. Congress, including this committee. And in fact, our, in June, our board of directors uh, <clears throat> went to uh, uh, Mexico in June as well. We can tell you from firsthand knowledge in those meetings, uh, both here and there, the concerns and resultant impacts are <clears throat> real and, and, and tangible. They are obviously extremely concerned about what is going on and confirm that they are looking for alternative sources of supply. While we have worked to reassure and advocate for our customers, we have strong but unconfirmed evidence that Mexico is slated to purchase corn from South America beginning in August and September. And given the political uncertainty, our customers have told us that rather than continue taking future positions for grain purchases, they could resort to more volatile and risky spot markets. 
This may sound minor, but is a sea change for our industry happening now, and that will change how the Mexican industry invests in infrastructure in, and impact our demand for years to come, as well as through our value chain. This angst is translated into actual impacts with U.S. corn exports down 7% since the first of the year. Keeping in mind <clears throat> the substantial gains we have experienced from NAFTA and the close relationships we have built with our customers, both Canada and Canada, again, you know, I'll repeat, it is imperative that all parties make every effort to do no harm <clears throat> uh, to our existing markets as modernization talks begin. Given these overriding concerns, though, the Council did recently contract to conduct some economic analysis to measure the impacts of both improving NAFTA and if negotiations failed. <clears throat> in, uh, in short, uh, you know, improvements that could help facilitate trade and remove non-trade barriers will indeed help yield increased U.S. corn production and exports. Conversely, though, uh, we can see that if we resort to pre-NAFTA uh, most favored nation tariffs, uh, we could see uh, you know, you know, impacts uh, in terms of lower commodity prices, reduced profit margins, lower U.S. corn and grain production, higher farm program payments, and, and lower U.S. GDP. <clears throat> So, you know, in addition, you know, we hope that whatever negotiations are conducted here that, you know, agriculture doesn't end up being uh, caught up as a retaliation target. You know, moving forward, we believe NAFTA modernization should build on the, on the provisions uh, and objectives of Trans-Pacific Partnership. TPP in included several important provisions uh, that uh, would be well suited for this agreement. Uh, obviously, the industry has changed since the early 90s, and we believe NAFTA can evolve with it. Uh, and so we support several of the provisions I've outlined in my testimony. <clears throat> Finally, it, it's time for, is critical for this process. Uh, and, you know, again, you know, the discussion around NAFTA has caused significant uncertainty in the market, and we, we need to get that resolved. In closing, I would emphasize that U.S. producers pride themselves on being the supplier of choice. To continue that over time, we must have strong policy across the globe, particularly with our closest neighbors and customers. Our relationships with Canada and Mexico are telling to the rest of the world. If we cannot satisfy our top markets, what does that say? Thank you again for the opportunity, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. Thank you, sir. Mr. Hammer, five minutes. Mr. Hammer, five minutes. All right. We're on, right? Good morning, Mr. Uh, Chairman Conway, Ranking Member Peterson, the members of the committee. Thank you for calling this important hearing today to discuss renegotiating the North American Free Trade Agreement and the opportunities to achieve the best deal possible for American agriculture. My name is Tom Hammer. I'm president of the National Oilseed Processing Association. NOPA is a national trade association representing 13 members engaged in the production of food, feed, and renewable fuels from oil seeds. It is noteworthy that our members process over 95% of the U.S. soybean crush annually. My comments will focus on the U.S. soybean sector, but also on our most important customer group, the domestic meat and poultry sectors. Agriculture today represents NAFTA's biggest success story. We stand ready, however, to work with the members of Congress and the administration in identifying ways to renegotiate NAFTA to create new opportunities for agriculture. NAFTA benefits the U.S. soy sector in two ways. First, by increased exports of soybeans, soy meal, and soy oil, but as said earlier, also increased exports of meat and poultry products that use soy meal as a primary feed ingredient. NAFTA has created significant market opportunities for U.S. exports of soybeans and soy products. Mexico is our number one export market for soy meal, our number one market for soy oil. It is our number two market for soybeans behind China. Canada ranks as, <clears throat> excuse me, our number three market for U.S. exports of soy meal and our number nine or ten market for soybean oil. However, unlike the tremendous success stories for U.S. soy, we are aware that there are some major unresolved market access issues for exports of dairy, poultry, and eggs to Canada. And I would like to comment on several of the key negotiating objectives 
that are of importance to NOPA. We are still in our initial review process and may have more to say on some of the negotiating objectives later, such as the retention of uh, investor state dispute settlement and dispute settlement chapters. Any renegotiating of the NAFTA must preserve current market access levels for U.S. agricultural commodity and products, including all tariff and duty preferences. In simple terms, as you've heard already, do no harm to our current excellent export positions in Mexico and Canada. Resolving the longstanding Canadian policies designed to negatively impact exports of U.S. dairy, poultry, and eggs would be another top objective for NOPA. Also, implementing an expanded sanitary, phytosanitary, SPS plus, and rapid response mechanism consistent with but improving on the TPP text to ensure that science-based SPS measures are developed and implemented in a transparent, predictable, and non-discriminatory manner is another objective for NOPA. Moreover, adding a new NAFTA chapter on biotechnology, which again was included in the final TPP text, is a major objective for my organization. Under a modernized NAFTA, NOPA requests that the U.S. government enter into a mutual recognition agreement with Canada and Mexico on the safety determination of biotech crops intended for food, feed, and further processing, and also to develop a consistent approach to managing low-level prevalence of products that have undergone a complete safety assessment and are approved for use in other countries, but not necessarily in all NAFTA member countries. In summary, NOPA welcomes this opportunity to provide the committee uh, that you have provided to identify ways to renegotiate the NAFTA while preserving the core benefits of this important agreement. NAFTA has led to tremendous expansion of the U.S. oilseed processing sector with ripple effects that have benefited the broader U.S. economy. Our business sectors have grown, people have been hired, and strong <coughs> supply chains have been built based upon the current agreement. So as I said, do no harm must be the guiding, overarching objective of this renegotiation. Moreover, a renegotiation of NAFTA should first and foremost preserve the current market access, including the tariff and duty preferences, but additionally, we ask our negotiators to fiercely protect the gains achieved in NAFTA to date to ensure that these gains are not eroded and trade-offs for gains to be achieved and other non-agricultural sectors of the American economy. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify. And NOPA, as I said, stands ready to work with the members of Congress and the administration as we commence this critically important renegotiation of NAFTA with our Canadian and Mexican trading partners. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Brown, five minutes. Thank you, sir, and appreciate the opportunity to testify before the committee this morning. I'm Reggie Brown. I work for the Florida tomato industry, and I'm here also on behalf of the Florida Fruit and Vegetable Association, producers of fruits and vegetables in Florida. Florida and the U.S. specialty crop producers are high-quality, competitive producers, and we can, in fact, compete on a free and fair traded enterprise. We are not opposed to fair trade. But we're having a problem in the specialty crop industry in this country, and that problem is not limited to Florida. It is happening in states like Georgia with crops like blueberries and broccoli. It's happening in Texas with crops like watermelons. It's happening in California with the desert grape industry. It's happening to the asparagus industry in California. All the specialty crop producers in this country are having a problem with the current NAFTA trade relationship. You've heard this morning there's been a number of folks testify about the positive side of NAFTA. We have a $5.3 billion trade deficit with NAFTA. That $5.3 billion is specialty crop fruits and vegetables coming into this country. While our friends in the grain and the meat industry have fared well with NAFTA, the fresh fruit and vegetable industry has been taking it on the cuff from the standpoint of unfair competition coming into the country. For instance, when we started down the path of NAFTA, the tomato industry in the United States produced two out of every three tomatoes in this country. We now produce approximately one of every three tomatoes in this country 
the tomato industry has shrunk by some 40% in volume. This is nationally, not just Florida's problem. And we have had 25% reduction in the acreage of the tomato industry in this country, fresh tomatoes. We are the canary in the coal mine. We are an example of what is going to happen to many of the specialty crops that compete with Mexico. And part of that problem is being driven by the fact that the Mexican government has been subsidizing and providing incentives for expansions of that industry in Mexico. They also have been trading in product prices into this country that would constitute dumping in competition with producers in the United States. And they also have a tremendous advantage in wage rate. The wage rate in Mexico is approximately one-tenth what the American producer is paying for wages in this country. The NAFTA renegotiation objectives of the administrations that were shared back in, on the 17th of this month on improving the trade balance and reducing trade deficit within the NAFTA countries is a very positive one for us. We are very concerned about the provisions for a perishable and seasonal application of dumping and countervailing duty cases that would allow some of these commodities that are being targeted to be competed against, to defend themselves against unfair trade practices. We would like to see the trade laws in the United States, as does the administration for anti-dumping and countervailing duty and safeguards being strongly enforced because we are basically an industry under assault. We do appreciate the support of the members of this committee as well as the Florida delegation and their support letters to Secretary Ross con concerning these issues, but the reality is the expansion of the specialty crop industry in Mexico, for instance, in just the last 16 years, strawberry production has gone from 16 million pounds to 216 million pounds of strawberries. The bell pepper industry, when NAFTA was signed, two out of every three bell peppers was produced in the United States. Today, one to one, and it is progressively getting worse. We have family farmers being forced out of business by unfair trade practices coming from our competitors to the south with a $5.3 billion deficit in trade of agricultural products with this country. And those individuals, once they are gone, they will never come back. We are basically witnessing the disassembling of the fruit and vegetable industry that competes in the environment of a season that Mexico produces product from this country. And when those family farms are sold, and when those businesses are broken up, there will, no, there will be no capacity to grow those fruits and vegetables within the bounds of the United States of America. I thank you for the opportunity of being here this morning. Well, thank you, gentlemen. <clears throat> the chair remind members they'll be recognized for questioning in order of seniority of the members who are here at the start of the hearing. <clears throat> After that, members will be recognized in order of arrival. I appreciate my colleagues' understanding of that, uh, that process. I recognize myself for five minutes. <clears throat> Mr. Frazier, um, the, the NAFTA has appeared to create a supply chain between north, uh, north to south that, that allows uh, the movement of cattle uh, across uh, both borders. Uh, there's a chart in your testimony that's uh, U.S. bead trade with Mexico, and it basically shows uh, almost a break-even. Imports and exports uh, to and from uh, Mexico have uh, reached a, uh, a common level. Can you? Walk us through why, how that's happened and, and what did NAFTA do to facilitate that? Well, first of all, we have a lot of feeder cattle that come from Mexico that are fed in feedlots in the United States and then processed in our, our packing plants. And uh, yes, that is kind of an equilibrium, but I think we need to remember that a lot of those, that beef that's produced from those Mexican cattle gets exported around the world and goes into the Asian markets and all over the world. And as part of the $6 billion you know, export market that we have around the world, Mr. Chairman. Well, is that, is that uh, <clears throat> balance of trade between the two, a sharp increase in imports from, from uh, Mexico during the last five or six years? That's, I guess, part of the drought that we had that-, that It is. That is. But is that necessarily a bad thing? 
Well, it is, and what they're doing is they're building infrastructure in northern parts of Mexico and parts of Mexico. There are feedlots that are being built in Mexico and some packing uh, infrastructure that's going into Mexico, and that's resulting in some of that beef coming into the United States. But we still export a significant amount of feeder cattle into the United States that are fattened and then processed and exported around the world. All right. Mr. Vilsack, or Secretary Vilsack, uh, geographical indicators uh, continue to haunt us, and uh, obviously with the uh, in bilateral agreements where countries decide that they will recognize each other's uh, geographical in uh, indicators then when they try to do a deal with somebody else. Can you talk to us about, obviously, Parmesan cheese is a big issue with uh, with the dairy, can you talk to us about the impact that, that bilateral deals with other countries uh, may affect NAFTA's negotiation on GIs? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the Canadians have entered into an agreement with the European Union, uh, which essentially grandfathers in existing uh, utilization of common names for existing facilities, but prohibits and prevents future facilities from being able to use uh, certain cheese names. Uh, this obviously is deep concern to our, our cheese industry. If we're going to increase exports, and, and our goal is to try to get from 15 percent of our volume to 20 percent of our volume, cheese is going to be incredibly important. Uh, if we essentially allow the Europeans to monopolize certain terms of cheeses, uh, that will create no market competition. That will make it difficult for us to, to market much, much of what we can produce in this country. Uh, Mexico right now is negotiating with the EU for a free trade agreement. And I think what uh, we're concerned about is which negotiation gets completed first, the, re uh, the modernization of NAFTA that could potentially reinsert the GI protections that were in the TPP agreement, or will uh, Europe do what they recently did with Japan, enter into a free trade agreement that basically restricts Mexican use of, of GIs. It's a very critically important issue and one that I think prompts us to encourage bilateral discussions and their modernization uh, discussions to proceed expeditiously without delay. Uh, we can't afford to lose this race with the EU. Gotcha. And uh, thank you. Mr. Brown, on, uh, on your issue, I'm aware that there are certain uh, U.S. growers who have built facilities in Mexico and that, uh, uh, that they're imp importing those, uh, that product. Uh, how do, do you have any sense of, what the, of, your, of your distortions? How much of that is uh, actually U.S. producers choosing to grow in Mexico and bringing that, uh, those products in the U.S. US versus uh, folks who don't have that kind of opportunity to, uh, to compete. Can you break that market down for us? I, I can't give you absolutely specific details, but it will actually vary with the particular commodity. In the case of the tomato industry, there are some U.S. producers that are participating in production enterprises in Mexico, but to a large part, the tomato industry in Mexico is driven by Mexican interest. Uh, in the case of strawberries and blueberries and some of the fruit crops that are exploding in Mexico as we speak, there's a lot of uh, American interest relocating from California into Mexico in that process. So it will vary depending on the commodity okay. firm. So uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, you go back, Mr. Peterson, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary Vilsack, uh, welcome back to the committee. Uh, good to see you here again. Um, so I understand you went down to Mexico, I guess, and met with uh, some of the folks down there. And um, I guess you had a good result from that. Uh, <clears throat> we went down and uh, Jim Mulhern from National Milk, Michael Dykes from the IDFA, and I went down to uh, Mexico primarily to reinforce the belief that our relationship with Mexico is not a transactional buy-sell relationship in dairy. It's a much uh, more of a partnership. Uh, we're trying to grow consumption of dairy products generally in Mexico, which will create opportunities for Mexican producers, but also create opportunities for us on the export side. Uh, following our visit, we, we saw uh, increased sales, and in I think last month we were uh, at or near a record in terms of our exports to Mexico. Yeah. Well, thank you. And uh, my question is, uh, have you uh, done a similar trip to Canada, or do you intend to? Um, <laughs> You know, to go up and talk to those folks about. We have we have conversed with Canadian officials. Uh, we have not necessarily. I haven't gone up to Canada. Uh, we have been very clear about our concerns about Class Six and Class Seven, uh, the impact that it's having not just on our ability to export uh, into Canada, but also the impact it's having on powder prices generally. That's why ten of the leading uh, trade organizations in the dairy industry globally uh, have expressed deep concern about the Canadian process. So. Our goal here is to make sure that our administration and the Canadian administration understand how serious this problem is. 
Um, as I said in my opening statement, the um, <clears throat> Canadian interests up there continue to buy up our processing, um, <laughs> which I don't know if it's good or bad, but it, it does <clears throat> seem curious <clears throat> what happened with this situation with grassland, where uh, um, Agripor was involved in buying the surplus milk, and as I understand it, they paid $7 a hundred weight less than the pool price. So, you know, just this whole situation that's going on, uh, Dar you know, I told the Canadian um, Ag Committee, they want to know if there's anything they can do for me. I said, yeah, I said, get me a, a quota to milk 100 cows in Canada, <laughs> because that's one of the most profitable things you could ever do, <laughs> if you could ever get that quota. So, you know, I, I, um, I don't know how we resolve this. They, they seem to be going to defend this no matter what. And, you know, in, they're just, you know, they make so much money up there, they can't invest it in their own industry. They're coming down and buying us up. It just, it can't be good. I don't know what you guys think about it. Well, it's not good. Uh, and it certainly uh, is detrimental not only to American producers, but also Canadian consumers who end up paying a significant amount more for their dairy products than they would otherwise have to pay if there was a, a freer flow of, of product cross border. Uh, Congressman, I, I don't know that we have all the answers, but I would suggest to you that this renegotiation needs to focus on significant tariff reduction. It needs to focus on greater transparency in, in the process. The Canadian government clearly manipulates uh, through policy and regulation uh, this market. Whenever we make an inroad, then the rules change. Uh, we, you can't ask uh, American companies to uh, invest hundreds of millions of dollars in a processing facility uh, if there's no expectation that the market that they're counting on for the payment of that expansion is going to be present six months from now because the Canadian government changes the rules. So it's clear that this process has to be more transparent and more predictable. Thank you. Mr. Brosh, um, I was reading your testimony about the, um, in spite of the fact that they have this export or um, supply management in poultry, and the fact that you're somewhat limited in what you can export, I guess, but you're still, it says in here that, that Canada is the number two export market in the United, for the United States? That's correct. How, how, how can that be? <laughs> I mean, yeah. we have, we have, we we have a limited quota. Country, we have a limited right? quota for certain products, and we, ha we have no quota for other products that the poultry industry produces. For example, fall, fall meat, we have a lot of spent hens in the United States. Um, Canada is a deficit producer for their own market of, of poultry, and so certain products they're going to need no matter what, and those products make it into Canada. And they are in Turkey, we, we uh, export Turkey to Canada, but they're about 16% of our exports right now, total if you look at all products. Um, I understand uh, the, the Secretary's concern. I, uh, we have those concerns and have had those concerns for years. We'd like more access to the market. We were hopeful that the administration would pursue the TPP because we thought we had some gains uh, locked up in the TPP in Canada. Of course, TPP also offered us what we really wanted was access to lots of other markets. Um, Canada is not going to solve the problems of the U.S. poultry industry, frankly. Um, we need all the markets around the world to to have access. We, we, we produce stuff for 100 markets. Um, so we would like improvements in Canada, but the truth is, right now, Canada is our number two market. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, Mr. Time expired. Mr. Lucas, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Frazier, I think we'd all agree that whatever's done on NAFTA will likely set the tone for future trade deals, particularly as it affects agriculture. Could you expand for a moment in this renegotiation process? what would be important to the beef industry and other sectors that could happen uh, in the future, say, as it might then apply to other countries, Japan, China, for instance, as trade deals come together? <clears throat> well, number one would be, you know, we have no duties on products going into those countries. So that would be no tariffs, no duties. That would be number one. Uh, you know, we just, we feel like that NAFTA is working for our industry. Um, it's providing a lot of value-added products that we are able to sell around the world. It utilizes a lot of grain products. And, you know, we would like to see more of the focus now on bilateral negotiations with Japan in the absence of TPP and bilateral negotiations with other countries around the world and, and replicate 
some of the things that we think are beneficial in NAFTA. Is there anything that uh, potentially would come up in such a renegotiation that you think could be damaging or harmful to future trade deals, <laughs> things we should be concerned about? I mentioned one, country of origin labeling. If that gets back on the table, we don't need to that back on the table again. I guess that would be our, our biggest concern. And anything that would have to do with uh, trade-offs around duties or tariffs put on uh, American beef going into Canada and Mexico. Mr. Gabler, it's my understanding, and I think it's been reflected in comments here, that uh, as we approach potential NAFTA renegotiations, uh, Mexican buyers are shifting to short-term uh, contracts and looking at sources uh, perhaps for grain outside of North America. That's the way I'll word that. Uh, and this is just based on the potential for change in NAFTA. Could you discuss for a moment what the impact would be if this renegotiation turns out to be an extended process, what the effect could be on your folks and for that matter agriculture in general? I guess I'm looking for justification to move quickly, whatever we do. Well, thank you, uh, Congressman uh, Lucas. Um, well, as I said in, in, and is written in my testimony, we haven't even got to the negotiation and we've got a 7% decline in our sales since the beginning of the year. Uh, <clears throat> and we did, you know, try and come up with some analysis uh, to try and measure the potential impacts. Uh, I didn't cite them in my oral testimony, but, you know, we're talking about some, some real numbers here. Uh, you know, our total grain production could fall by 1.2 billion. Uh, you know, we would have, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, a loss of, uh, of about $6 per acre. Uh, you know, there would also be increased costs because, you know, the model, you know, imputed that there were probably $1.2 billion in, <clears throat> in farm program payments. So <clears throat> that's just... Uh, you know, a, a shot or a guesstimate uh, of what the potential impacts could be. Uh, and if we're not getting this thing, this, this negotiation done by the end of the year, uh, you know, we anticipate that uh, this erosion will continue. Uh, and all of us who are in the international export business know that once you lose market share, even with your best customers, it is very difficult to recover it. Secretary Bilsack, the last time we went through the Farm Bill process, you said in a different role, and you were responsible for the entirety of agriculture. And I know you have concerns for the entirety, <coughs> always. Uh, is it fair to say that as we approach 2018 and the next Farm Bill process, that perhaps just as important as comprehensive Farm Bill policy is, uh, what happens on NAFTA and these trade agreements will make or break us as an industry? Your observations? Well, Congressman, uh, Canada and Mexico, uh, Mexico is our number one market, Canada is our number two market uh, for dairy products. So clearly uh, what happens here will make a difference uh, to the nearly 42,000 operations that are producing product. Uh, look, we have to fix what's, what's broken in Canada. Uh, this is a market that is, is far too closed. Uh, it is not transparent. It, the, the rules are constantly changing. And there are some serious issues that have to be dealt with in, in, this, in these negotiations. And to your point, they need to be dealt with immediately. Uh, this is not a situation where we can have an extended conversation about changes because we are facing competition with the EU and, and their efforts to get free trade agreements with Mexico and the, and the one that was recently done with Japan. So it's incredibly important that we get this done quickly and we get it done right. <coughs> and to get it done right, we have to preserve what's what's working, we have to strengthen what can be strengthened, and we have to fix what's broken. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Scott, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a big issue. It's uh, very important to my state of Georgia. Under NAFTA, Georgia has a lot to lose if these export markets shrink due to uncertainty. And that's the big word here, this uncertainty that's floating. And as we are considering this issue, I put myself in, um, in Mexico and Canada's shoes. And I asked myself what I would do if my largest trading partners was thinking of backing out of a deal. I think I would start looking at other countries to <coughs> trade with in case our deal is broken. And this is why I wasn't surprised 
uh, panel, when um, Mexico bought five times more corn from Brazil uh, than it imported from Brazil last year. And in your testimony, Mr. Gappler, you showed that it may very well be even worse than I had thought. And when I hear the administration saying that they will follow a first do no harm strategy, I really came to help but wonder if we've already began to see some harm on America's agriculture industry. And I also worry about repeating battles. Um, and especially, uh, Mr. Frazier, uh, last week the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative announced in its uh, negotiating objectives in updating and strengthening the rules of origin. Now, we all have fought this fight over and over again and uh, can tell great stories on it. Uh, so to repeat this uh, mandatory of country origin labeling on U.S. beef products we're all aware of, uh, Mr. Frazier, can you comment and tell me if you have any concerns about this objective um, that the U.S. trade representative is offering? Are we in any way uh, having to fight this uh, cool label all over again? Well, I hope not, uh, and I'm not going to speak for the U.S. Trade Representative, but we feel strongly that, you know, country of origin lamely did not work. Uh, WTO ruled in favor of Canada and Mexico, and our conversations with them is very clear yeah. that if that's brought back on the table, they will, they will put in retaliatory <coughs> tariffs on U.S. Yes. beef going into Mexico and Canada. So your, your answer to that is that you're, you're somewhat worried, but you feel we won't have to repeat it. Is that right? Well, yeah, we would be concerned if there's any discussion about it coming back on the table. Okay, We're let me... against that. All right. Um, let me go to Mr. Bush for, for a second. Um, one place where I see a possibility of hope is increasing the quota access in poultry to Canada. The poultry industry has a very similar supply management situation in Canada as the dairy industry does. I mean, if a U.S. company decides it wants to do business in Canada, they first have to build a facility. They have to build growing barns. They have to get office space, packing, shipping, and processing. And then they've got to have a purchase quota. However, after all that, they can only purchase 250 kilos or 550 pounds of import quota. This small amount of production ensures that no competition can come into Canada. So Mr. Brush, can you tell us how was this allowed when NAFTA was first negotiated? Well, NAFTA was first negotiated as the U.S.-Canada free trade under uh, President Reagan in 1984, and I was, frankly, a lot younger man than I am today. It actually is before my time, but essentially they, uh, the Can Canadians essentially retained their, um, their res reservation under the WTO, which they've had for many, many years for supply management, and the WTO rules allowed that at the time. Uh, we thought when NAFTA was um, negotiated that that they couldn't maintain that. And there was actually a challenge case brought by the U.S. dairy industry, uh, the USTR on behalf of the U.S. dairy industry, and we lost that case. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, as a legal matter, which, and, and frankly, I know, never quite understood how we lost that case, but as a legal matter, um, the Canadians were upheld in that, that dispute uh, settlement case. So um, it all goes back to that original negotiation where they uh, essentially claimed their right to reservation. Thank you. Chairman, it's time expired. Uh, Mr. Gibbs, five minutes. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for the panel of being here. Secretary Vilsack, uh, you mentioned about the supply, dairy supply management in Canada and some of their policies. And this Ranking Member Peterson talked about the quota that's quite pro profitable in the dairy industry up there when you're in quota, and, and they're using a lot of those profits to, to buy processing here in the United States. I don't, I'm not that familiar how their quota system works up there, how their supply management system works, but is it possible? for dairy producers in Canada to exceed their quota and then 
move that milk to the United States to the processing plants that they own in the United States? Let me give you an example of, of the Canadian system so that you, that you have a better understanding. Uh, this Class 7, which we've raised concerns about, uh, essentially what they've done is they've essentially allowed uh, processors to pay about 15 percent less than what they would normally pay for a U.S. product uh, to go into their processing. Uh, and that has created, as a result of a significant increase in butter and, uh, consumption, has created a lot of powder. So they put the powder basically on the world market at a below world market price, which drives the price down for everyone. That also would impact Canadian farmers, but they've allowed for adjustments on the other classifications of, of milk products and dairy products. So Canadian farmers basically break even in this system. Processors benefit from cheaper supply, okay. and powder is dumped on the market. And essentially what that has done is it's created havoc for our producers, and for that matter, for producers in New Zealand and the EU. So it's the ability of the Canadian government to essentially manipulate this system whenever there appears to be the need or, or uh, the U.S. is making inroads, they manipulate the system. Uh, and and that's, that's the problem. Uh, and it guarantees a price for Canadian producers that's significantly greater than what they would get uh, in a market, and the consumers end up paying for it in Canada. So they just created a whole new class, that's class seven, that was a part of the agreement? Exactly. We were having ultra-filtered milk going into the Canadian market, creating the opportunity for processors <coughs> to use our ultra-filtered milk. When we began to gain market share, they created class seven, allowed the processors to basically purchase Canadian product for 15 percent less than what they would pay for U.S. product. That ended the import opportunity for us, the export opportunity for us. Uh, it created opportunities for processors to profit in Canada. Uh, and it didn't hurt the Canadian producers because they increased in uh, uh, the other classifications so that they could make up the difference in other classifications. And the, the losers are U.S. producers and Canadian consumers. Uh, back to the ranking member's comments about the uh, co-ops or the producers of Canada buying processing here in the United States. Uh, what do you see? That, is that happening? And what do you see that's happening? What's the phenomena there? Well, well it, it is happening, and of course it happens in a number of other industries, but the, the bottom line here is what we really need, uh, and the conversation needs to focus on creating a system where the Canadian government can't manipulate the system okay. to impact and affect. We need predictability. We need transparency. As I said earlier, you can't expect American processing facilities to be expanded or built if they're counting on a Canadian market that can change every, every two or three months. Uh, the, and this is not the first circumstance. Class 7 Class 6 are not the first circumstance of changes. They change product standards. Uh, they change uh, the way in which they calculate whether quotas are being met. It makes it incredibly difficult and unpredictable for our industry. Uh, and so our hope is that this modernization conversation allows us to fix these problems because they okay. have been a serious I, consequence. I, I do want to, and maybe Mr. Broch might want to comment. Uh, I know it's hearing mostly about NAFTA, but with the TPP gone, uh, bilateral agreements so the administration talks about, uh, it seemed to me that the, the two countries that we ought to be having uh, serious discussions with would be Japan and Great Britain. Am I correct in that? In uh, I think for us, Japan was one the big win in TPP. Um, the problem, of course, as you realize, Congressman, and I, I did trade negotiations for a number of years, is that there, it's never a one-way street. Yeah. And the problem was in, in the TPP, which is a plurilateral agreement, Japan was getting benefits from uh, opening open markets in other countries. And so there was, a, there was a trade off for them. Whether or not Japan is willing to give us access without those trade offs is going to be the big challenge. And uh, in, um, in my discussions, I think that's going to be a huge challenge. The, the Japanese government's going to have a difficult time finding a benefit in a bilateral agreement. Even though that the United States is by far the largest economy in the world, there's benefits in non-ag that they would benefit? I'm, I, I, I'm just, I, you're asking for my speculation. I think yeah. that's going to be a difficult yes, go sell. Ahead. Well, you know, uh, I've actually had some discussions with Ministry of Ag uh, and, and Food and Fisheries at, at Japan. Uh, you know, they, they clearly, uh, you know, want to uh, keep the TP alive they're they are managing the TPP 11 process <clears throat> they would like to actually leave uh, an opening for the US to come in at some later point <clears throat> but I think the message that 
you know, we are, you know, are going to hear from them is, is that, <clears throat> you know, they do not feel like they can get into a bilateral negotiation and particularly from agri their agricultural standpoint, if they have to come in and make, you know, more severe concessions that they did under TPP, that they would be, you know, they would view that as a net loss and politically, you know, would not be able to support that sort of process. I, I just want to add this, Mr. Congressman. Um, I did the bilateral negotiations with Japan during the Uruguay round for four years, and I can tell you this is not easy. Uh, their, their agricultural sector is, is pretty uh, sacrosanct. They, they import about 55% of their food needs in Japan, at least they were at the time. Um, they see um, this is a real critical matter of food security, so unless there's some big benefit for them, it's a very hard push to open agricultural markets. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The time has expired. Mr. Costa. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I uh, uh, welcome this in the discussion, and I think that the last comments that were made about uh, trade being a two-way street where you have to have win-wins is right on point. Um, NAFTA, uh, I hope, will be modernized and renegotiated, uh, but uh, I was very frustrated to see the narrative change over the last uh, 18 months or so uh, during the uh, campaign year because I think it didn't accurately reflect uh, the successes of NAFTA, notwithstanding the fact that we need to modernize it. Uh, California leads the country in agricultural revenue and our producers are twice as reliant on foreign trade as the rest of the United States. Let me give you some numbers. On uh, NAFTA partners, Mexico and Canada account for 22%, 22% of California's agricultural export. In 2015, for that year, Mexico accounted for $3.5 billion in agricultural trade, Canada $1.1 billion. Um, and I, I just think it's inaccurate to say that when you look over the last 20 years and any objective criteria that you measure it by, that uh, it's been a disaster. It hasn't. Or the single worst trade deal that's ever been negotiated. It hasn't. Yes, it needs to be upgraded and modernized, but we did that in TPP, as was pointed out, and I think it was a mistake to walk away from it on the first day without having read it or examined uh, for what I think is primarily political purposes. Uh, notwithstanding the rhetoric, um, uh, I think that any objective analysis shows that when you look at job loss, and I'm very sensitive to the job losses and to the situation with uh, our friends in, in organized labor on manufacturing, when you contrast it to where we are in terms of the totality and where we want to go, uh, the fact is is that uh, we need to renegotiate this successfully. I have serious concerns as to you whether or not we can do this uh, in the light of a bilateral. Let me ask the panel, panel members, is there any chance that a renegotiated uh, agreement could lead to improved conditions for migrant agricultural workers, which we are in short supply in the United States? Or is it more likely that the labor force will relocate, relocate in Mexico if the agreement boots economic productivity there? Who wants to take a, uh, a whack at that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Congressman, I'll, I'll just simply say in the dairy industry, there, there is a, a level of concern and anxiety uh, based on uh, the, the failure uh, for us to actually solve our immigration issue uh, in the U.S. Uh, we've got a broken system, and it is impacting and affecting dairy production. It's uh, affecting all of agriculture. Well, I, I can't speak for all of I understand that. today, but, but I can't uh, with confidence. Let, me, let, let me go beyond. I mean, I mean, we remember clearly uh, in 2010 with the Mexican truck driver issue, and then in last year with the country of origin labeling. Each side has leverage. I remember very, very clearly uh, when tariffs went on on wine table grapes in 2010 and cheese production in Mexico, and it took us 18 months to get those tariffs removed. And last year, both Canada and Mexico were putting the list together on retaliatory activity if, in fact, we didn't uh, take action on the country of origin labeling. Uh, is it not true that there's leverage on both sides? I see head nodding. Yes. Um, well, I, I'll tell you one of our concerns in the poultry industry. Um, a number of years ago, um, a, one of the companies in, Can in Mexico brought a dumping case in, in Mexico against 
our, our industry. Um, I actually have gone down and testified in that proceeding. We were able, through the cooperation of the larger Mexican poultry industry and the Mexican government, to get that duty um, suspended. Essentially, they've never applied it, but it's sitting there. It's sitting right. there on the books in Mexico, and it could be applied at any time. And our concern is that something's going to happen in these negotiations in another sector. Well, it has to be a win-win. I mean, if it's a we win and you lose, Right. No and, country's going to agree to and, that. And we've had experience, Mr. Congressman. I mean, that makes um, good politics, but that doesn't make a trade deal, maybe. Well, we're, I'm just telling you, our concern right now is I, that— I share your concern. Let me just quickly go, because my time is running out. Um, uh, who was the big winner, in your opinion, when we walked away from TPP? Um, and these countries are still trying to go ahead. China. China? Mm -hmm. You agree? China? Yeah. Well, I think there's a consensus there. I think China was the big winner on this. Well, the, the, the EU also won in the dairy because they just recently negotiated a, a, an agreement with Japan, which gives them more market access and some protections in terms of GIs. Yeah. Well, my time's Mr. expired. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll Mr. Scott. figure out a consistent Mr. agricultural trade policy in the near future. Jim, it's still time. It's still expired. Mr. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Brown, as you were talking about um, Florida tomatoes, I couldn't help but remember some of my Georgia tomato growers back in 2008 when they had uh, warehouses full of uh, a crop that had just been picked and um, they couldn't sell them because of a salmonella outbreak that ended up being Mexican peppers. Uh, there's no telling how many millions upon millions of dollars uh, <coughs> Farmers lost through through my area before I was in Congress, but I remember quite well some of the long-term families that had been extremely good farmers in the. Horse. We estimated a hundred million dollars was lost at that point, and there's been no way to recover that. In several court cases where the industry has tried to retrieve that money, uh, we failed. It it literally um, it probably killed some people just from the stress, and and through no fault of their own. No fault to their own, pe people lost. Uh, in some cases, things that it took generations to build because it literally just harvested. You talk about, as we talk about renegotiations of NAFTA, I think it would be more of adjustments to an existing framework. But from the standpoint of the fruit and vegetable growers, uh, what do the renegotiations need to contain uh, to address your concerns on trade? One of the big concerns that we have, we've had a dumping case, uh, the U.S. tomato industry's had a dumping case in place for 20 years. Many of these other uh, commodities, especially where they're seasonal and perishable producers, are producing, for instance, our Florida strawberry industry produces about 15% of the fresh strawberries in the country, but they produce them from the period of December till about the 1st of March. Mm -hmm. They cannot avail themselves of U.S. trade law to defend themselves against unfair trade practices such as dumping or countervailing duty uh, subsidization on the Mexican side of the border. And Mexico's pumped uh, tens of millions of dollars into protected culture agriculture, which is exploding the productivity of the Mexican <clears throat> specialty crop industry, and it's coming back into the U.S. We need to have some way of allowing those industries to use the tools to defend themselves and create some kind of a carve out under the trade law and under the treaty for perishable and seasonable producers to be able to join together to defend themselves. Okay. Thank you for that. And uh, as we go forward, I know uh, we're not here to talk about the Farm Bill, but I know especially crops is an area going back to that 2008 scenario where um, the government made a decision that hurt those people, basically bankrupted them. And um, I hope we take a, a serious look at what we can do uh, for specialty crops that they participate in. Um, been a lot of, lot of discussion on the uh, chicken issues already with regard to Canada. Just, but just uh, one more time, um, how do we achieve greater access into Canada while uh, making sure that we don't disrupt the market access that we currently have in Mexico, Mr. Brosh. 
That's a good question, Mr. Congressman. I, we thought that the, the, the key to this was essentially a, a plurilateral agreement under TPP. We thought that this was the, our best chance to make progress in Canada because Canada had, you know, Canada wasn't interested in TPP initially until it saw all the countries that were in there and then they realized they had to be at the table or they were going to be left out. And this really put the pressure on Canada to do something about poultry access. And it's unfortunate that we're not in there. Um, we're having a hard time seeing exactly what the leverage is uh, at the current time. And as I said, you know, we do have a fairly significant market in Canada, even though we, we would like to do better. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to yield the remainder of my time. Chairman, yields back. Uh, Ms. Fudge, five minutes. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. Um, we all know that there is no perfect piece of legislation, so we know that everything should be reviewed. It is time that we start to talk about reviewing NAFTA. Although, Mr. Chairman, I am uh, somewhat dismayed that there is no one representing labor at this table, and I would just say that for the record. Um, the administration has decided that it'd like to come to some closure on a new NAFTA agreement by sometime the beginning of next year. Now, I mean, that might be good for a Rose Garden photo op, but it is a much more complicated issue than just a few months, uh, as is healthcare, by the way. Complicated. Uh, it is important that we make sure that the interest of U.S. producers are protected in whatever agreement we come up with. And so I am hopeful that you are taking some time to educate the White House on what you believe should happen with a new NAFTA. Um, I think that it, when we sit and talk about trade, we have to be sure, once again, that we protect American interest and not other countries' interest. Uh, we could indeed come up with a new plan and have serious damage to U.S. producers. I think probably all of you are saying that. And I certainly want to ask you now, what, if anything, are you prepared to do to make sure that this deal, that your position is heard. Mr. Brown. We are doing everything we can to communicate throughout the administration the concerns of the specialty crop industries out of Florida and, and other parts of the country. We have talked with the U.S. Trade Representative's Office. We've talked with the White House. We have worked our delegation here in Florida, and we've had uh, the opportunity to certainly make people aware that all is not well when there's a $5.3 billion deficit and it's on the backs of the specialty crop fruit and vegetable industry in this country. And it is American farms and American communities that are going to be destroyed if we don't take steps to ensure that we have a free and fair traded environment where those enterprises can continue to feed America here with American product. Thank you. We're just going to go down the line. Thank you. Uh, we have been trying to carry the message to the new administration from my member companies through our association and through uh, combined efforts of uh, many coalitions that we work with. I think a message that you heard throughout here today is while there's opportunity for improvements, uh, the message of do no harm, I think, has been said loudly and clearly from uh, American agriculture that is benefiting. My industry, the soy processing industry, our increase in value to, since the beginning of the NAFTA to Canada and Mexico has been over $2 billion in trade this year versus trade in 1993. We, because of free trade agreements that we have in the Caribbean and Canada and Mexico, we own those markets. We have them 100% of the year. We often are in a cyclical market share situation in other markets where <clears throat> South America produces at different times than we do. But by, by serving their markets year-round, we're able to keep our processing plants open year-round. If we were to lose those markets, we would be closing U.S. processing plants. We already know our members have gone down there, and there is great angst, and we have seen our sales of soybean meal in the first six months of this year in value dropped 21 percent from the same period a year ago and in volume dropped 13 percent from this period to a year. 
They are making adjustments now. They are telling our <coughs> member companies that they want their contracts to be on much shorter contract terms. That is not good for a good sign for our business. We need to send this signal to them that we want to continue this supply chain relationship that we have with both Canada and Mexico. Thank you. <clears throat> well, the U.S. Grains Council uh, participates in this U.S. food and ag trade dialogue. Uh, they provided extensive comments to, to USTR. We provided our own extensive comments. As I mentioned in my testimony, we have engaged our customers, particularly the Mexican livestock and feed industry. <clears throat> We've gone down there numerous times, heard their concerns. We thought it made sense to have people in Congress and the U.S. Department of Agriculture hear those concerns, so we brought them up to do that. <clears throat> in addition, you know, we continue to have ongoing dialogue with the administration. The uh, July time expired. I'll ask the other three witnesses to uh, submit their answers for the record. Which is fine, Mr. Chairman, but, you know, everybody else went over a whole minute. But I thank you very much. Appreciate it. Ms. Crawford, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to make up for some of that and just uh, focus on one question. Um, Mr. Gabler, um, prior to NAFTA, Mexico was a a minor importer of U.S. rice, typically sourced from Asia. Um, since the implementation of NAFTA, they've become the largest market for U.S. rice, particularly important to Mid-South region, medium and long grain production. Um, in the last few years, um, it's been a little bit of a threat that they might revert back to Asian sourcing. And, and uh, one of the deals, for example, is a side deal related to TPP where, where uh, Vietnam could access Mexico a market duty free. Um, I guess my question is: Does the, does NAFTA renegotiation process create any problems for that competitive edge that we have in Mexico with regard to to rice that might accelerate their decision to now start to source from Asia? <clears throat> well, I, I guess my re, uh, my response would be is is that we uh, <clears throat> we we've seen the growth of the Mexican livestock industry, and we've seen their ability to gain efficiencies, economies of size and scale. <clears throat> A lot of it has to do because <clears throat> of the, our arrangement with us by giving them reliable supplies. <clears throat> and part of what you saw, I think, in the TPP negotiations was is that Mexico, like every other country, is looking to be a net exporter of, of products, including agricultural products. And I think they viewed the opportunity that they are efficient enough to compete and actually export some of those those products, the value-added products outside of their markets. Uh, you know, and part of it, you know, was I think some of the concessions they gained as part as TPP. But I, it's all under you know underdriven and and enlightened by the fact that our system with no tariffs and the ability to create the efficiencies have made that possible. And I would remind you that Mexico already is very aggressive. They have 46 FTAs already, so they, they know how to negotiate trade agreements and get access. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield my time. Gentlemen, yours back. Um, Mr. Tom O'Halloran, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is that getting close, Tom? Hey, that, you've got it. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, you know, Back in the Depression, my grandmother and grandfather lost their farm, and uh, uh, it's probably still in existence, but times have changed. And uh, Mr. Brown, you had mentioned about the loss of family farms, and that concerns me a lot. But what concerns me uh, also is the, the entire process that we're going through right now. Uh, one of you mentioned that uh, you hope that we have this done by the end of the year. Well, as you know, the timeline for this from the administration goes way into next year. And that's without the complexities uh, that will be, have been men mentioned today and the other ones for other industries. I, I, that concerns me probably as much as the loss of the family farm because it's an ongoing process and, and it is going to hurt agriculture in America. But um, I, I guess what I'd like to know from uh, Secretary Vil Vilsack um, is uh, we d you, you've been down to Mexico, so the political environment, I'd like to hear a little bit about that. Uh, and your, your uh, ideas about the bilateral uh, need 
in a timely fashion, and, and if you feel that's going to be accomplished to make sure agriculture in America stays competitive. And then if you have time, some uh, discussion on what you have identified clearly as the EU problem. Well, there's a, an election in Mexico next year, uh, which I think is prompting the Mexicans to want to conclude uh, discussions as quickly as possible. But it is correct to say that this is a very complex set of negotiations. And uh, the Mexicans are skilled at this. Uh, and they understand that they are on tooled tracks. Uh, on the one hand, they're negotiating with us on a re modernization of uh, a renegotiation of NAFTA. On the other hand, they're uh, negotiating with the EU on a free trade agreement. And they're essentially, in my view, uh, sort of working off uh, each other. In other words, they're suggesting to us, well, maybe the EU will have a better deal for us. Maybe we need to conclude those negotiations before we conclude NAFTA. They're probably telling the Europeans the opposite. Uh, and they're looking for the best deal for Mexico. So it is important and relative, relevant for us to be able to conclude this agreement, particularly as it relates to things like the GIs, the geographic indications that we've talked about earlier. We don't want to give the EU yet another uh, notch, if you will, in, in that effort to try to preserve and protect common names and create a, a due process system. Uh, we face some serious competition in the dairy industry, and we also face an incredibly productive industry. Uh, we anticipate and expect by the year 2022 that we'll have 14 million more pounds of dairy product that will need to be exported or we'll need to find a market above and beyond what we will increase domestic consumption. So these export markets, these trade agreements are incredibly important in order for us to sustain the family farming operations that are represented in the dairy industry. One of the benefits of dairy is that we still have very small operators, operations, we have very large operations. And they are mutually uh, coexisting, if you will, because of exports and because of increased domestic consumption. So I take it the, uh, the need for uh, expedited activity uh, in the bilaterals is an important part? It, it absolutely is. I mean, when we, when we took ourselves out of TPP, uh, it essentially created, I think, an urgency uh, in beginning and concluding bilateral discussions, not just in the context of NAFTA, but also in the context of some of our Asian, uh, our Asian partners. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield. Jimmy yields back. Uh, Mr. Davis for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question first, uh, Mr. Mr. Gabler. Uh, as in your testimony, you mentioned the commercialization of biotechnology that occurred after the U.S. ratified NAFTA. And as the chairman of that subcommittee that has jurisdiction over biotechnology issues, I, I'm really interested in hearing your opinion on what can be biotechnology's future role in a possible renegotiation, if you could expand upon your comments. Well, yes, as, uh, as Tom had noted in his testimony, TPP provided some foundational language in bi on biotechnology, which was really kind of the first time that I'm aware of that, that biotechnology was even addressed in any trade agreement, bilateral or otherwise. And they put Do you think that's a necessity in future trade agreements? Sure. Lay it out? Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely because <clears throat> the markets, uh, you know, particularly China and the European Union, continue to have asynchronous biotechnology policies. The other part of what we've proposed is, is that we've tried to explain that, you know, there's been over 660 products assessed over that 20 years. Each government, you know, uses fairly similar process, risk assessment processes to do that. And there's been an effort, uh, you know, to try and come up with ways to share that information in a way that, you know, if a country uh, has already adopted the proposal and look, and, and, you know, the other country looking to approve it could look at, it could say, yeah, we'll review that documentation if it meets our scientific rigor you know, we will do that rather than repeating the whole process. So we're trying to get that kind of foundational uh, language as well into this North American free trade agreement because, you know, in my view, this will probably be our foundational document moving forward on other FTAs. And so we want to build on that, that what we achieved in, in TPP. Mr. Hammer, did you have any comments you would like to make? Uh, yes, uh, as, I, as we're in both in agreement, uh, NOPA works through a coalition called the U.S. Biotech Crops Alliance, which represents from the tech company all the way through to the exporter 
the grains and oil seeds. And we are very, very uh, unified on this point that we need to put biotech uh, agreements in our trade agreements. This is an excellent example. We wouldn't have even contemplated this in 1993. Uh, of one of the areas where modernization is so necessary. And it does have so much to do with the marketability and fungibility of our grain trade globally. This is high priority for NOPA and I think virtually everyone in our value chain. Well, thank you very much for your comments. I agree. And I hope that we open up more opportunities for biotechnology and its growth as we move forward and have to continue to grow more food on less land uh, with a, a very much a growing population. Uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome back. Glad, glad to see you here. I'm used to you not being surrounded by anybody and in the middle of the table. Uh, but I, I just wanted to say welcome back. It was great and a, great to work with you, a pleasure to work with you over the last few years uh, when we sat in different places in this room. And, and I look forward to working with you in your new capacity. So Thanks. with that. It's good to be back. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jimmy yields back. Mr. Panetta, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thanks to all the witnesses for being here. Uh, thank you for your uh, preparation. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I represent the Central Coast of California, 20th Congressional District. Uh, as Mr. Davis knows well, uh, it's called the salad bowl of the world based on its specialty crops, number of specialty crops. Um, and I can tell you, when you're driving through Salinas from pretty much April to October, you want to avoid it because there's so much production, there's so much traffic going on there. However, in the other five months, it slows down a little bit. And there's not that production during that, not that much production during the winter months, at least there in Salinas. But let me tell you, there are family farms that continue to produce and continue to be successful during those winter months. That's because they have farms in Mexico. Uh, a number of farms in Mexico. And what it turns out to be is sort of a, a complementary relationship. Uh, there are farms here, and then the other, the, uh, the winter months, they're able to produce in Mexico, and so it allows them to continue to be successful, continue to make money, which they can then invest in their farms here in the United States. Uh, in fact, it, you know, especially there in, in the Salinas Valley, which is close to Silicon Valley, allows them to invest in mechanization and obviously to, to deal with the labor issue or lack of labor issue uh, that we're all facing here in the United States. And so many of you, I think most of you, uh, except one person said that you, in renegotiating NAFTA, you don't want to do harm. You don't want to do any harm to the production. And Mr. Brown, you're the only one I didn't hear say that. And instead, Mr. Brown, I heard you say specialty crops are an industry under assault. And I can tell you that in the Salinas Valley, in the salad bowl, they are not under assault. Uh, they are actually taking uh, advantage and benefiting of farm production in Mexico. And so I guess my first question to you, Mr. Brown, would be, have you been to the Central Coast? Yes, sir. Okay. Have you spoke with family farmers such as uh, Bruce Taylor? Uh, I'm fully aware of the expansion that's taking place. And those expansions, uh, Mr. Panetta, are basically managed ventures and investment opportunities in Mexico. What we are concerned about is the wholesale subsidization of Mexican expansion into other specialty crops that are basically being creating excess, excess capacity that is being basically grown for the U.S. market, pushed into the U.S. market, and it's price depressing. Your farmers are managing their supply and making their enterprises work as good businesses should. But when you release the capacity that's being built in Mexico in the last decade and dump it into the U.S. market at whatever price, as you well know, produce is sold on whatever the price is. Today is the price because we can't store it. And if we, we all operate under the premise, you either sell it or you smell it. And it basically depresses prices for many of these other commodities, but it is a different kind of business than you're referring to out of the Central Valley. That's right. Uh, and so once again, have you spoke with the specialty crop farmers there on the Central Coast? I have not personally had that okay. conversation with Central Coast farmers. Okay. All right. Because uh, they will tell you, uh, as uh, you know, I spoke with Kevin Murphy of Driscoll's Farms, Bruce Taylor of Taylor Farms, Rick Antle, uh, 
TNA Farms, Dickey Pichot, Lakeside Organics, they will tell you that their production in Mexico is benefiting them uh, and benefiting uh, your family and my family by allowing us to eat fresh fruits and vegetables year round. Uh, you, the question was asked by Mr. Costa, the Mexican production that is U.S. owned uh, in Mexico, you, you, are you familiar with that percentage? I don't have a percentage and I don't know there is a percentage anywhere in existence that I've ever been aware of. Okay. Does Florida have the same, um, do they have farmers that have farms in Mexico as well? Generally speaking, no. We have a very limited number of farmers that have some tomato operations in Mexico, but they're basically Florida-based operations. Understood. Understood. Great. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. I yield back. Jim yields back. Mr. Allen, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, again, I want to thank everyone for being here and talking about the importance of trade, uh, particularly as it re relates to agriculture. And uh, obviously, uh, agriculture is the largest industry in my state, uh, Georgia, and the largest industry in, the, uh, in my district. Uh, and of course, we grow a variety of things in my district, the famous Vidalia onions. Uh, and um, and some uh, obviously fruits, vegetables, blueberries, and uh, of course cotton, peanuts, and uh, we are Georgia is the top exporter of peanuts and poultry, uh, and it's the top five exporter of cotton, pecans, vegetables, and melons. And according to the U.S. Census Bureau, since 2004, Georgia's agriculture exports to Canada and Mexico have more than doubled, uh, from just less than 300 million to almost 720 million in 2016. Uh, one of the things that I hear from my constituents and one objective that I'm happy to see in this package is the elimination of Chapter 19. Uh, while we continue the process of renegotiating and modernizing the NAFTA, it is essential that we highlight the benefits to the agriculture sector. However, we need to look in the, at the areas uh, which some of our commodities have faced uh, challenges. Uh, of course, Mr. Brown, the, uh, you, you've talked about the uh, dumping issue, and of course I was interested in the conversation uh, that we had there as far as the, um, uh, it, it, as far as what California is doing versus say, you know, of course Georgia, we're becoming a big blueberry uh, grower. And uh, uh, what is your suggestion on how, you know, as far as if we're, if we're talking about NAFTA and we're talking about how do, we, uh, how do we fix this issue where we don't affect, say, you know, California, but obviously we, it, it's good for Georgia and Florida. You, do you have a solution? Right now in the U.S. trade law, in order for a dumping case to be filed to have standing, you must have 51 percent of all like product in the country as a petitioner in that process. This basically handicaps any regional, seasonal, perishable producing entity. Uh, for instance, uh, as an example, our Florida strawberry industry, which is 15 percent of the domestic supply. Most of the rest of the domestic supply comes from California. But in the period of the winter months from December to March, when California is a minor producer, if a producer at all, to any great extent, we are competing with Mexican product coming into the country at very low prices, and it basically is depressing the domestic strawberry market during that period of time. A redefinition or a, re, or a modification that would allow for these very specific seasonal perishable products, things that can't be stored, they're going to have to be sold in a marketplace and compete in a given time period in that marketplace, for those industries to have what every other industry in this country has the privilege of having, which is the right to defend themselves from unfair trade practices. And we're not saying close the border. We're just saying if, if you're dumping stuff in this market at less than your cost of growing it, that's an unfair trade practice. Right. And Without that modification, those pieces of American agriculture are going to be ground up. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, as far as uh, uh, Mr. Brosh, as you mentioned, the U.S. poultry industry has been among America's most important and successful production and export sectors. And of course, in Georgia, we're a top exporter of, uh, of poultry uh, out of the port of Savannah. Uh, 
you mentioned in your testimony in the past decade, two or, uh, of our five most important poultry export markets have been Mexico and Canada. However, Canada has a supply management uh, for poultry. Can you give us uh, more of an explanation of that and how it affects U.S. exports for poultry? manages the border through um, limited quotas. Uh, we don't have tariff-free uh, trade into Canada like we do on all other products except dairy and poultry. They, they've been exempted uh, under their reservation, WTO reservation, and they've been able to maintain that. So we only get a small quota. I think our current quota is something in the order of seven or uh, 10,000 tons into Canada, very small. However, we do sell um, other products into Canada. Uh, we've managed uh, to uh, sell products that aren't limited by that quota. The big one I was talking about, uh, an example, is uh, um, a fowl, spent fowl, which uh, goes in, in the processed product uh, category into Canada. So despite that limitation, we still have uh, Canada as our number two market. It's, it's surprising to most people, but that's the way it is. Uh, we would like more access into Canada. We certainly would like that, and we thought um, that we were on that track in TPP, but unfortunately, we're not there anymore. Okay. Jim Thank you. Jim Mr. expired. Mr. Lawson, five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Welcome uh, to the committee. Uh, uh, gentlemen, and especially uh, Mr. Brown, you know, I uh, reside in North Florida, same as uh, Congressman uh, Dunn. Uh, and it get cold up in uh, North Florida, unlike uh, when we talk about some area in South Florida where uh, Mr. Yoho is. Uh, Central Florida, <laughs> but uh, we're still able to get out about two crops a year uh, uh, and, and tomato growers. And when I talk to the tomato growers up there, they're really concerned about NAFTA agreement. And so, uh, like with Mr. Allen, talk about uh, in Georgia, we, we're right there on the border. So I have some tomato growers who are growing tomatoes in Florida, and then they're also growing them uh, on, on the other side of the line in Georgia. How is this uh, NAFTA negotiation w would help or hurt uh, those tomato growers that we have in North Florida? If we have the ability to improve the capacity to enforce uh, trade law aggressively in that treaty renegotiating process, there is a dumping case that has been in place for 20 years for the U.S. tomato industry that was filed a couple of years after NAFTA was enacted. If that uh, suspension agreement, which is currently in a suspension agreement from that dumping case, if there was aggressive enforcement to where we didn't have a lot of circumvention and price suppression <laughs> due to that circumvention, it would improve the well-being of those tomato growers and uh, I think Mr. Williams would enjoy a, a better marketplace in his operation there in Quincy. Okay, <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. Uh, but the other thing I would say, the other thing that I asked a great deal about is how immigration is, uh, issue is going to affect them uh, because they won't be able to get the tomatoes out of the field because uh, we, we don't have, uh, uh, we can't get a lot of the people there uh, to want to go and get these crops out of the field and it directly affects them. So immigration, I know the president talks about it a great deal, but it is very critical up there in Gaston County. It's extremely important that we resolve our issue of an agricultural workforce in this country because most all of the fruits and vegetables in this country are hand harvested. And without that workforce, which basically puts food on the table for America, we're going to have problems going forward with those agricultural entities surviving. Okay. And one other question to the committee, uh, and I support uh, uh, the uh, NAFTA, but I am... Uh, Concern about uh, the focus on education uh, uh, and how education with our 1890 institutions uh, can be utilized uh, in the research to help us uh, attract more individuals into the agricultural industry um, and what kind of research it can be provided uh, to promote this, uh, uh, the industry where some of the people who own family farms the other people don't want to go into it, but we need the research in order to uh, maybe uh, help these institutions attract more people to it. Can anyone elaborate on that with the time that I have left? 
Well, I can tell you one thing that we've done in the poultry industry, Congressman. Um, we, uh, we recently renegotiated um, our access to South Africa under the African Growth Opportunity Act. We had trouble getting into South Africa, and we recently renegotiated. And part of that renegotiation, we agreed to support students um, from South Africa who were um, especially uh, the um, uh, historically disadvantaged students in South Africa, and we're bringing some of them to um, uh, agricultural colleges in the United States to, to train. I think we, that's a good model. I think we could uh, use that model um, in, the, in the future in our NAFTA negotiations to look for opportunities that are similar. Okay, thank you very much. And just one thing I'm gonna say, uh, uh, when, you, when you're talking about Mr. William uh, in, uh, uh, in Gaston County, <laughs> he, uh, he told me just a couple of weeks ago is that uh, uh, we, we can't do anything uh, with uh, the dumping that is coming in from Mexico. You know, that we don't have the authority to do anything. And I'm gonna just cut off Mr. Brown where you can just say something one more time. We have had uh, the dumping case in place for 20 years and I will give credit to the Mexican government and the Mexican industry. They are fierce, aggressive negotiators and competitors. And uh, we continue to try to ensure that the domestic tomato industry survives going into the future. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Tyler expired. Mr. Fazo for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And uh, I appreciate the panel being here. It's really been a very timely and instructive uh, uh, set of presentations, and I appreciate that. I wanted to, uh, Governor Vilsack, I wanted to ask you about a topic that you had, and I, I also, uh, Appreciate uh, having an Albany Law graduate here as well. It's, uh, appreciate the, a lot of people in my marketplace are Albany Law folks. Um, your testimony, go in, you go into great detail about the uh, Canadian trade practice on ultra-filtered milk and the uh, barriers, Canadians don't call them that, but the barriers in essence that the Canadians are putting to the import of ultra-filtered product from the United States and its impact now on the export market uh, to countries that uh, we would typically be exporting to as well. And I think what is, what is incomprehensible to me is how Canada can, with a straight face, get away with this and how this doesn't run afoul of existing trade agreements that they have uh, adopted. Could you expound on this a bit and give us uh, some advice as to what you think the committee should do and what the U.S. Trade Representative should do about this topic? And I have three minutes and 36 seconds left, and if you could give us that answer in that time, I'd appreciate it. Uh, Congressman, uh, I, I think I'd start by saying that if the Canadians were here, they would say, well, gee, what's the problem here? Uh, exports uh, from the U.S. have gone up. It's a little bit misleading for them to use that talking point because, in essence, what happens is product is exported into Canada and then re-exported outside of Canada back into the United States in a value-added proposition. So it's, it's not what we traditionally think of of exports where you export a product and it's consumed in the product that you're exporting to. Uh, this is an issue uh, where the Canadians have essentially evaluated their market and when they see the U.S. making inroads, the rules change. Uh, they create a new class, they change a product specification, uh, they uh, re redefine a product so that it, it will now qualify for, for uh, tariffs as opposed to uh, uh, being duty free. It, it is a constant battle uh, that we have been engaged in in trying to open this market up and trying to uh, educate the Canadian consumer that they are really paying a lot more for their products than they would have to if there was more, uh, if there was a freer trade arrangement. Uh, it also has an impact uh, b because of the the incredible increase in butter consumption. Uh, this has created a glut of powder, of uh, milk powder, uh, and normally that milk powder in Canada would have been fed uh, uh, to livestock, but there is so much of it uh, that what they should be doing, obviously is providing an opportunity for the U.S. to import into, uh, export into their country, import into their country. Instead, what they've done is they've basically put it on the open market at a price lower than the world market, which is depressing overall powder. And that's why the 10 leading 
dairy associations, uh, uh, global associations have come out and said, look, this is a problem in New Zealand, it's a problem in the EU, it's a problem in the United States because it is depressing uh, unfairly the market. Uh, there can be a lot of conversation about the letter of the law, but clearly the spirit of a number of agreements that Canada has, has entered into uh, we think are se severely tested by this approach. Uh, agreements that they've made in the past. Uh, and that's why this renegotiation is so critically important. Let us get a much more predictable, transparent process. Let us get more, more stability in the process. And let's open up the markets. Let's take a look at uh, ridiculous tariffs that are currently in place in Canada. The uh, overquoted tariff for fluid milk is 241 percent. For butter, it's 298 percent. For cheese, it's 245 percent. I mean, there are multiple opportunities here for us to have a much better relationship with Canada as it relates to dairy. And if we had that, then there would be greater predictability, there would be greater stability for our producers, and consumers in Canada would benefit. And, and what are consumers in Canada paying for fluid milk as compared to the U.S.? Well, it's significantly higher, and that's why you'll see uh, in border communities people traveling across the border to essentially purchase in the U.S. Now, what's interesting about this is uh, there, there, are, there is a, a quota system, and the Canadians are basically saying for fluid milk, look, uh, our consumers are coming across the border and purchasing uh, milk in the U.S., and that satisfies our quota. Well, wait, you, they're not even tracking that. They're not even keeping track of that. So how can they say it satisfies the quota? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Jefferson Thomas Byer. Mr. Soto, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We all know the history of NAFTA filed and passed by a Republican Congress, signed by a Democratic president in 1991, and taken aside the manufacturing uh, decline that happened. Uh, agriculture's really been kind of a mixed bag. We've seen the big guys get bigger, the small guys get smaller, or even go out of business. And I think a lot of that has to do with the scale they were operating at or the ability to really withstand unfair trade practices that have occurred over the years through some other members. Uh, of the of the coalition. I want to start out with uh, you, Mr. Brown. First of all, welcome. Uh, I'm no stranger to Maitland. It's uh, just a few miles north of our district and uh, part of that wonderful place we call Central Florida. I uh, wanted to go through some specifics um, based upon your report about things that you think there's already existing language and after you could work with or things that need to be changed uh, in your mind. First, with regard to subsidies and and incentives provided by the Mexican government to their producers. Uh, are, are there sufficient uh, provisions in NAFTA, or do we need to look at changing areas re with regard to um, uh, helping out our growers in Florida? One of the important things that needs to be addressed, as we talked about earlier, is this seasonal perishable issue to where the Florida industry could defend itself against those unfair trade subsidies with a countervailing duty case. If you had to go to a national countervailing duty case, not only do you have to round up all the producers or 51% of all the producers of the product that is defending itself, but you also have to prove injury to that entire body of, of producers. And many of these problems are very specific to time periods of market dumping or market subsidization of product going into a specific market. So that would be a major adjustment in that process would be having the ability to do that, to use those tools that most everybody else is entitled to in the country. So regional standing in particular, especially with the fact that we have that window in winter time right. that uh, a lot of our fruits and vegetables really try to hit that mark. Uh, with, what about with labor costs being at 10 percent of what we're paying here in uh, in the United States, uh, down in Mexico, and and in addition to whether that's going to be helpful, do we have to make a change, or are there sufficient uh, laws in the books for NAFTA already? The labor standards that are currently in place don't really address the, the, the real labor issue for fair working conditions and, and standards of living and this sort of stuff and minimum wages in Mexico like we have here in the U.S and they would make some significant adjustment to that. And in addition, there is also the issue of the devaluation of the peso over the course of the 20 years to where there is a, a very strong pull of product coming into the U.S. simply because it's trading in dollars 
and, and working that workforce for pesos and buying materials and inputs with devaluated pesos, which is a very significant uh, advantage as well. So we're talking about dumping, labor costs, currency manipulation, subsidies. These are sort of the nuts and bolts of what we're facing right now. Makes our business a very challenging business in Florida. Absolutely. Uh, Secretary Vilsack, I know you have a real global perspective on all this. Is, is there a balance we can strike with uh, a lot of folks who are succeeding under NAFTA and those who, uh, who are facing some obstacles? Well, I, I think there's an instructive uh, example for dairy, at least, uh, in Mexico, uh, where we see this as a partnership. Uh, the Mexican producers uh, have at times felt threatened by the U.S., and, and oftentimes there's this belief that somehow U.S. agriculture is going to come in and essentially overwhelm uh, the, the domestic agriculture. What we've done in dairy is we've said, look, we're here to try to build demand for product in Mexico, which we know will help you producers, but will also create an export market for us. And that's precisely what's happened. Uh, production in, uh, in the last decade in Mexico has increased by 58 percent in dairy, their own producers, but that's been more than enough uh, overcome by increases in consumption. Uh, so I think there is a way in which we can continue to find ways to be mutually benefit from trade. It's got to be a two-way street, otherwise it's not, at the end of the day, it's not going to be particularly effective. Thank you. And just finishing up, uh, Mr. Frazier, do you think there, we could strike a balance with cattle as well and other big product from our district? Excuse me. I was, uh, somebody was whispering. Could you repeat what you asked? Uh, I, well, I guess my time has expired, so. But thank you, though. Uh, gentleman's time has expired. Um, but certainly encourage you to maybe submit that for the record so that uh, I'd be able to get a response in writing. Um, I'll take the liberty of uh, the, uh, my five minutes here. Uh, every pun intended, I'm going to continue to milk the dairy issue with you, Mr. Speak, Mr. Secretary. Um, there's been some heated rhetoric on all sides of the trade debate in the last few years, and I think it's important for uh, trade-dependent sectors of the economy uh, to communicate the benefits that we have from trade. Um, how do you see the importance of trade for the next 10 years for the dairy industry, and what do we need to do as a country to help you achieve your goal? The, in the dairy industry, the U.S. dairy uh, industry, the image of the industry around the world it, historically has been one that's been uh, an industry focused primarily on the domestic market. Over the last decade or so, that's begun to change, and in many markets there's now a recognition that U.S. dairy is in the export game to play. Uh, I think we have to continue to increase our presence, both physical presence, more people, uh, more capacity in some of these export market opportunities to send the message that we want to compete effectively with New Zealand, effectively uh, with the EU. Uh, I think it's important and necessary that we obviously have trade agreements that are fair, uh, that are transparent. Uh, I think there's a classic example here with what's happening in Mexico where we've seen nearly a nine to ten time increase in export opportunities for dairy in Mexico versus what's happening in Canada, where the rules consist, uh, consistently change. Uh, if we could get the same kind of opportunity in Canada that we have in Mexico, obviously that would, uh, that would be beneficial. Here's the issue, uh, Congressman, and you know this better than anybody because of who you represent in central Pennsylvania. Great dairy producers. They're going to continue to produce more milk, somewhere between a percent uh, to a percent and a half more each, uh, each year. Domestic consumption is going to increase. Uh, but we want the opportunity also to stabilize markets through exports. Uh, and so if we can increase presence, uh, increase capacity, and, and change the image of American dairy uh, globally uh, and get fair trade agreements, uh, I think we'll do very, very well in the next 10 years. Um, keeping with that theme, and you had mentioned about um, uh, Mexico, Canada, in terms of the whole You've, cl you've articulated clearly the importance of the NAFTA modernization. Uh, we had that conversation when you first came in. Uh, quite frankly, uh, most of my staff uh, were not alive when NAFTA was negotiated, so um, having something that has an element of staying current and modernization is important no matter what the trade agreement is because the world is changing around us. Certainly the industry of agriculture changes around us. 
Um, and you've talked about the importance of, of NAFTA modernization for the dairy industry as well as the value of seizing the moment, negotiating additional trade agreements with our potential partners around the world. I, I think the two go hand in hand. Would, would you agree that NAFTA modernization process will directly impact our ability to make good progress and equally critical uh, areas of the world, such as with Japan, Vietnam, and others? Well, the hope would be that we would contain in uh, NAFTA renegotiation and modernization specific provisions relating to SBS, uh, sanitary and phytosanitary rulemaking, uh, the ability of uh, making sure that, uh, uh, that we protect the use of common names for cheeses, for example. All of that can have an impact on future bilateral discussions. Uh, the more market access we get, the better off we are to make that case in other uh, more closed market opportunities. So clearly there's a benefit here, uh, and that's why it's incredibly important, especially in the absence of uh, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. It's incredibly important now that we engage very aggressively uh, in bilateral discussions and get this renegotiation completed because our competitors are, are not waiting around for us to act. They are moving forward very aggressively. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Mr. Hammer, uh, you stated that U.S. Uh, soybean exports have grown significantly over the past 23 years. Where do you see opportunities for growth in trade with Mes Mexico and or, or Canada? Uh, I think it'll be primarily a, a demand growth, a population growth. It's basically unfettered now uh, in Canada. We've indicated some opportunity for some poultry, egg, turkey, uh, dairy growth. Uh, it's a, it's a, we're, we're growing in the United States uh, consumption, and I think it'll continue to grow. For example, as, as incomes rise in Mexico, you'll see them go from maybe what they may be an egg diet to a, a poultry diet or on up the line, and I think you'll continue to see these uh, opportunities uh, grow with with the growth in the, and econ, ec the economy grows and as the, as the opportunities for the individuals within our three countries grow. Thank you very much. My time has expired. Now please recognize the gentlelady from North Carolina for uh, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Peterson, for hosting the session, and thank you all gentlemen for your testimony. Um, let me, uh, first of all, free trade agreements inevitab inevitably create winners and losers uh, in our economy. Some industries like agriculture, for example, are able to reap the benefits of trade through access to new markets and lower prices. Uh, in other sectors, uh, like the textile industry in North Carolina comes to mind, uh, trade leads to displaced jobs for increased competition and offshoring. And North Carolina's textile industry lost 82% of its workforce since the mid-1980s. And in Charlotte alone, uh, 30, 34,200 jobs were lost in, in the textile industry since NAFTA. And uh, NAFTA had a ma massive uh, negative repercussion on my state's economy. Uh, according to the Economic Policy Institute, North Carolina was one of the hardest hit states uh, in our country, sustaining some of, the, some of the biggest net job losses. So Secretary um, Vilsack, um, how can we balance these uh, competing needs to maximize the benefits for our agriculture sector while minimizing harm to manufacturers, to small businesses, and middle class Americans? Well, Congressman, I think one of the uh, hallmarks, at least from the dairy perspective, uh, and why we've been able to be uh, competitive and, and maintain a, a favorable balance is because of innovation. Uh, the ability of, uh, of our industry to adapt to the needs uh, and specifications of, of customers around the world. 95% uh, of the world's consumers are outside the U.S. Uh, there will be growing populations and growing middle class uh, in, in many parts of the world where it plays to the strength of American agriculture. Uh, so I would say one strategy for dealing with uh, trade generally is to make sure that America remains a, a place of great innovation, and certainly in agriculture, that's been that's been true. Thank you. Um, I, I know that agriculture is one of the few economic bright spots in implementing NAFTA, but I, I really cannot ignore the impact, the devastating impact that it's had on my state and my state's middle class. Of course, this question uh, is to is to every anybody who wants to answer it. How 
you think Congress can ensure that a rene renegotiated NAFTA benefits the majority middle class Americans? Anyone can answer this, or all of you? Well, we've already identified some areas where we don't want to do any harm, but where modernization and improvements are possible. I also think that one of the important aspects of the NAFTA will be, be a, that we develop a very uh, transparent dispute settlement mechanisms. Um, in our part of agriculture, we worry uh, that that Article 19 may be removed because it's an insurance policy that we don't have to have unfair anti-dumping or, or countervailing duty uh, practices, uh, trade cases brought against us. But we've also heard some areas from testimony today where our partners on the other side of the border may be using unfair trade practices. So I, I think a really robust dispute settlement mechanism uh, to, to make sure that fair competition is taking place uh, is a part of this agreement. And to that end, we would certainly not want to see ch uh, Chapter 11 or Chapter 19 uh, removed. Thank you. Any, any, anybody else like to comment? Okay. Let, let me ask uh, then, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Brosh, um, according to the Wall Street Journal, friction between the U.S. and Mexico over trade is starting to cut into the sales for U.S. farmers and, and agricultural companies past four months, uh, Mexican imports, uh, chicken, meat uh, fell 11 percent, the biggest decline for the period since uh, 2003. Uh, what do, you, do you have faith that the Trump administration will be able to renegotiate NAFTA without causing irreparable harm to our agriculture trading relationships? Congressman, we had somewhat the same experience that these gentlemen have talked about when um, the president announced he wanted to renegotiate NAFTA, we suddenly had a number of buyers who um, were looking to, de to um, differentiate their supply. Um, pr traditionally, I think, I've been told by the folks I've dealt with in Mexico that they sort of looked up at us as their big brother, their sort of pushy big brother, but their big brother. And I've been also told that since that announcement, they're not gonna look like at us the same way ever again. But um, they're looking at Brazil, they're looking at other sources of supply, and unless we move quickly, as um, Secretary Vilsack um, suggested, to um, close this, get this negotiation closed and get this improved and get it back on the books, um, we're gonna have uncertainty in Mexico and we're gonna have people looking at other possible suppliers, even for the things we're most competitive for. Thank you, sir, I'm out of town. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Jill A. Cyrus Powell, Dr. Marshall, five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my first question is for Mr. Frazier. Mr. Frazier, I've done about 40 town halls, 20 round tables, been to 30 or 40 ag-centric operations. And when I went back, I was expecting to talk about a farm bill. I think we're going to try to get to that sometime this year. But the number one issue has been trade. Trade, trade, and trade. Nothing more important to my district than NAFTA. It is our number one uh, revenue generator in an economy that is 60% agriculture related. What's the number one concern for, for the beef industry? Would be to do no harm uh, in this negotiations. Uh, don't do anything that would disrupt, from our perspective, trading in beef with Mexico and Canada. The, both those markets are worth $2 billion a year to our U.S. industry. So that would be my number one concern with NAFTA is do no harm. But put trade in perspective to farm bill over two years ago, all the farmers and the ag producers talked about was over regulation. Do you get a feeling that maybe that NAFTA is a bigger concern now than even over regulation to your industry? I would say there's both concern about both of those you know, things like WOTUS, some of those type of issues. There's a lot of concern about landowners and we obviously our industry owns a lot of land. But uh, trade is also a big issue. So I'm not going to pick one of those and say one's more important than the other. They're both important. Mr. Gabler testified, I believe, earlier about that the, we're actually seeing decreased corn sales already because of some of the uh, just concern that, they, that our markets were dependable or not. Are we seeing any, any of that yet in the beef industry with Mexico and Canada? Not yet. Although in the conversations with the Canadians and Mexicans, they are, they are concerned about some of the rhetoric that they hear in the United States about NAFTA. Okay. And uh, my last question, uh, we've had the pleasure to sit down, I think, 
three different groups from Mexico, grain purchasers, meat purchasers. Describe to me again a little bit the type of cuts of beef that we're sending their way and coming back and forth. So to Mexico, <clears throat> we send a lot of products like rounds, skirts, tongues, <clears throat> you know, intestines, products that we traditionally have not consumed a lot in the U.S. <clears throat> to Canada, we send, we send more of a high quality uh, ribs, loins into the Canadian market. Okay. Mr. Gabler, you, I, I think, at least I saw in some of your testimony, you talked about the, the value of the peso versus the dollar. Was that your testimony? Or is it in your, uh, one of your graphs? No, <clears throat> I didn't reference that, though. Obviously, it's, it's, a, it's an important issue. Fact is, it's, it's part of the reason why I think, uh, you know, it's, it's feasible, or at least potentially feasible, for Brazil to actually uh, potentially export into the Mexican market because they don't have duty-free access. Their transportation costs are higher. In fact, they have some internal programs that subsidize the movement of corn. So uh, I didn't mention it, but it's clearly an issue, I think, for every one of our industries represented here. Does anybody want to expand on that a little bit? Well, after the uh, administration announced that uh, there was going to be a renegotiation of NAFTA, I think um, the Mexican peso fell, fell against the dollar about 25%. Wow. I didn't and, uh, that. and that was that had nothing to do with currency manipulation. That had to do with the perception of the markets uh, and of what the, the effect on the economy is going to be. Well, that makes it much more difficult for uh, Mexicans to buy American chicken or American beef when, when they're, they're, they're their currency falls against the dollar. So yeah, that's, it's had a, had a big impact. Uh, Mr. Gabler, I'll follow up with you. I'm, I'm sure you're looking in the future further than I can look into it. You've experienced a six or eight percent drop in corn sales, I think you mentioned. Uh, Secretary Perdue has been a proponent, a strong advocate for trade. Do you, looking into the futures, do you feel like we're stabilizing that situation or is there continuing to be a drop in the future with Mexico and corn purchasing? <clears throat> Well, you know, we've done some long-term uh, economic forecasting with our economists and uh, looking 10 years down the road, and Mexico, you know, shows up as the one or two, uh, depending on which assumptions you use, uh, you know, market long-term. Um, so, <clears throat> and you know, if you look at the other countries that show up, some of them we have free trade agreements with, but some of them we don't. But I think in, in either instance for us, you know, our ability to tap in into those markets, whether we have FTAs or we don't, uh, you know, that's, the, that's going to be the linchpin here of our success, you know, in, in continued exports of corn, but also the value added products that come from that. So, you know, and frankly, I think, I think uh, Japan, the EU and others are going to look at these negotiations very closely and make a determination based on, you know, whether they're successful or if they go off the rails. Thank yep. you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thomas, uh, Mr. Dunn, five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Brown, I frequently hear from uh, stakeholders around the country about the high stakes of losing ground, losing what we've gained in NAFTA uh, in the course of a renegotiation. I understand their point, however, uh, the fruit, vegetable, and sugar sectors, sectors that compete directly with Mexico in, and affect us in Florida, have competed on an unlevel playing field for a number of years. And, and, and as a matter of fact, some of these are sort of under all-out assault uh, uh, from Mexico. So I, I would like to, if you would share, we share the same latitude with, with Mexico, so Florida is at greater risk, I think, with seasonal variation than other states and other parts of the country would be. Would you? Do you uh, uh, share with us some of the special vulnerabilities that Florida has and how you see that affecting us? Well, that seasonal overlap, uh, Mr. Dunn, is very, very critical to the fact that Florida was identified uh, 24, 25 years ago when the treaty was originally negotiated as the state that was going to lose the most in the fruit and vegetable industry, and I can attest to you that we have. But the reality is with the investment it has been driven by the Mexican government in the last 10 years in protected culture, greenhouses, uh, tunnels, uh, various kinds of saran shades. They have simply expanded their season on both edges to where historically we competed with them from December to March. 
Now the competition from Mexican tomatoes in particular, which I'm very familiar with, is now a year-round competition with all the tomato producers in the United States. And that's why the, the domestic industry has lost 40% of its volume that it had in production when NAFTA was signed, and why we've lost 25% of the acreage of fresh tomato production in this country to that competition. It's basically been supported, and it's fundamentally targeting the, the U.S. market with that product trying to build up that rural economy in Mexico. And we're suffering from it. Thank you very much. So I understand there are portions, this is, I want all of you to be thinking about this, the portions of the TPP may be a uh, template for the NAFTA renegotiation. So I want to know in your various sectors, and we'll start with you, Mr. Ginn, Mr. Brown, that uh, what, what language in the TPP that might guide the administration as they work to address the concerns of first fruit and vegetables and cattlemen and poultry and, and whatnot. So take it away. Two and a half minutes. Well, basically, the, the uh, directive was basically in the Trade Parties Accountability Act of uh, 2015, or addressing the issues, uh, elimin el eliminating practices that adversely affect trade in perishable and cyclical products, while improving import relief mechanisms to recognize the unique characteristics of perishable and cyclical agriculture, ensuring that the import relief mechanisms for perishable and cyclical agriculture are as accessible and timely to growers in the U.S. as those mechanisms are used that are used by other countries, and seeking to develop an international consensus on the treatment of seasonal or perishable agricultural products and investigations relating to dumping and safeguards. He was prepared for that question, wasn't he? <laughs> Let's ask the cattlemen if they have some specific wor uh, wording in the TPP that you think ladders over to renegotiation of NAFTA. You know, from our perspective, uh, TPP, the greatest uh, benefit to the beef industry in the United States was taking down tariffs in Japan and letting us be more competitive with the Australians and New Zealanders. So um, we already have zero duties and tariffs on products going into Mexico and Canada, so That's not I really can't think of anything. Very good. Mr. Brosh? Well, like the beef industry, we were interested in Japan. Japan was the big win for us. Uh, we were also interested in improvements of the SPS text. We don't think that the TPP SPS text is perfect. There's a couple of things that we don't like about it, but overall, we think it, it, it has some um, real promise uh, for improvements in the NAFTA. Uh, and uh, then we thought that we would have some additional access into Canada. Um, as well as a result of that negotiation, as I've mentioned before, but that seems to um, not be an opportunity anymore. Anybody have a, yes, uh, Mr. Secretary. Yeah, ge geographic indications uh, was basically dealt with in, in uh, the TPP agreement that provided a due process and a protection uh, for common names. Uh, that, that would be something that we would like to see uh, placed in this modernized NAFTA agreement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Isaac expired. Mr. Uh, LaMalfa. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, panelists, for being here today. I had to come from another hearing, as is fairly typical. So, uh, modernizing NAFTA would be very helpful. Ag the ag economy has prospered pretty well under it. Um, so I hope we can be optimistic about the discussions underway. So let me, let me go to Mr. Frazier. Um, in terms of the benefits, um, what gains in NAFTA negotiations would you be looking for, that would be important for beef specifically, that uh, may come from future deals, future negotiations for uh, open access? Well, as I said in my testimony, it Congressman, I, I, I really think that we're in a good place in the beef industry and NAFTA right now because we don't have tariffs on products going into Mexico and Canada. They're two of our top five markets for beef in the world. Uh, we have good relations with both those countries. Uh, we have uh, good relations with importers in those countries. So in any renegotiation, I, I, I just think we're in a really good place right now. Do you think anything um, in future negotiations could uh, be harmful? Do you see any see much threat of that? 
I mentioned one, if there was an effort to bring country of origin labeling back on yeah, the table, yeah. that could be because that would result in the Canadians and Mexicans putting on tariffs on our products. Yeah, believe me, we've uh, we heard all about that. That was a, a difficult deal. Um, so, well, I, I think I think that pretty much does it. I, the um, the magnitude of uh, additional trade and export for the industry. Is that it seems it seems if it's just taken off more and more on international trade. Can you we, can you touch on that just a little sure. bit? Sure, we feel really good about it right now. We're exporting about thirteen percent of our production overseas. Fourteen. Thirteen to fourteen percent. It varies month to month. We think uh, over the next five to ten years we could move that over twenty percent, maybe even to twenty five percent. China just opened to U.S. beef. Uh, now, there's yeah. some restrictions on the kind of product that we can send to China, which limits some of that. But we think long term, that's a great market and has a lot of potential for us. And they've opened up to rice, too, so I'm seeing this as a pretty good partnership. We can yeah. move those potato guys aside a little bit. So I, we just think that the, there's a glowing middle class around the world that desires U.S. beef. We have a unique product. Uh, it, you know, as we all know, it tastes great. Uh, consumers around the world, when they get to experience it, they love it. Uh, so we just think that there's a great opportunity for U.S. cattlemen in the future. Okay, thank you. Well, I hear a lot of talk about stakeholders, but you're the kinds that I like. So <laughs> thank you very much. I'm going to okay, go back, Mr. Chairman. You. Jim, you'll back. Uh, Mr. Yoho, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the panel being here and um, your, your uh, endurance of being able to stand this long. Um, you know, NAFTA, there's been some wins with that and there's been some losses with that. And I come from Florida and we went down to Homestead, Florida, and we visited the, the tomato region. And we used to get two to three crops. We produced about 60% of the tomatoes in the nation and NAFTA really hurt the specialty crops. Florida is a specialty crop. Uh, state with about three over 300 different specialty crops and uh, as we negotiate NAFTA and Mr. Broch you're the it sounds like you've done a lot of the negotiations um, I had the opportunity to go down to Mexico and we met with the finance minister currently that had negotiated NAFTA and we were talking about some of the wins and some of the losses and what we saw were the losses in the tomato industry where the farmer's grandson up in America wanted to take over the, the business but there wasn't a business to take over and we got in a little bit of a heated d debate down there and um, the other thing was the sugar um, policies where um, Mexico dumped sugar on it and the, the minister admitted that they did dump and he apologized for it. Uh, as we go forward and as you negotiate, uh, and Mr. Hammer, you brought up to have robust, robust reforms in there so that we can uh, negotiate and, and settle these disputes, these trade inefficiencies better. What is your recommendation to put into the new, new NAFTA to where we can call people out when we know they're cheating or do, doing unfair practices? Uh, what would you recommend that we put in there to make it a lot more efficient so it doesn't drag on for years? Well, I, I just think that has to be a focus because I think that's going to be the hallmark. I, I, would, I know at one time uh, there was a group of us that had lunch on a, a monthly basis and we were commodities that had all faced uh, what we thought was frivolous anti-dumping or countervailing duty cases from Mexico. They were unsubstantiated, but they were brought basically because they were trying to thwart. It was apples. It was corn. It was uh, corn syrup. Corn syrup. It right. was uh, meat. We were we were being looked at as soybean meal, and we were kind of a group that commiserated with one another. We met for lunch monthly and said, "What are, What are you doing to stop this?" I think we can look at some of the history of that and learn from that. Well, and I've heard over and over again that Mexico is very astute and very sharp at trade. I hope that we have those things in, in place. And I want to go to you, Mr. Brown. Uh, we've talked extensively on the tomato issue. What does it cost you to produce a box of tomatoes here in, in, domestically? Domestically, in the Florida production cycle, we're looking at a cost of about $10 for a 25-pound box. That's the cost of the box, the labor, yeah, that, the that's tomato put, itself. That's put the truck on the box on the back of the truck. What is Mexico selling their tomato, a box of tomato, here for? 
right now under the suspension agreement, they are not supposed to be selling a 25 pound box for less than $8.30 at the border. What are they selling it for? The problem we have is because of circumvention and erosion of the enforcement process, uh, you will see Mexican tomatoes in our terminal markets for five or six dollars at various periods times of the year. That's almost under the cost of production, isn't it? it it's significantly less than the cost of production. However, in uh, addressing the issue of enforcement and how dumping agreements work, the Commerce Department in the 20 years of the, of the case have never actually collected the cost of production from the Mexican industry. The Mexican and, and, industry's refused to provide it to the Commerce Department. And that's a safeguard that needs to be in the next NAFTA negotiation. Right, right. And Mr. Broch, I want to come back to you because as labor, yeah, go ahead. What he's talking about is not changes to NAFTA. He's talking about changes to domestic law. Those are things that we, we don't have a dumping mechanism in NAFTA. What we have is we have a recognition of the ability of countries to use their domestic law. So what Mr. Brown is really talking about is changing the domestic dumping law and dumping procedures, not about change. Here domestically? Yeah, I mean, okay. that's the only way you can do it. I mean, okay. legally, that's the only way you can do that. And then when we negotiate these, they're supposed to have fair labor practices. And, you know, uh, the, the LA Times, I think, or the New York, or the LA Times did a great expose in 2015 about the slave labor in Mexico, and we know that's going on. And if we're buying from them and it's negotiated in NAFTA, they're not supposed to use child labor. Under the age of 14, there's, you know, roughly 100,000 in the field documented. How do we get out of those kind of trade deals? Well, I, 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 everybody, no one wants to see anything like that. I know it. Congressman, I, I agree with you. I'm not, and I, I, I'm going to confess right here, I'm no expert okay. in the labor area at all. I appreciate Stein. your time. Jim I yield back. Jim Stein expired. Uh, Mr. Arrington, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, chairman tells me he saves the best for last, and, mm -hmm. and um, I'm going to take him at his word. I, uh, this is a big deal to ag producers all over the country. It's a, especially a big deal in terms of our trade partner with Mexico if you're from Texas. By the way, thank you all for coming. And Mr. Secretary, thank you for your service to our country. Also on the side note, Mr. Secretary, thank you for your support for cotton um, with the ginning assistance in 2015. Uh, we needed it and we desperately need more of it to get us to bridge us to the, to the farm bill and get cotton back in as a Title I commodity. But anyway, I really appreciate that. And any help you can give us with the current secretary in this administration for ginning assistance to follow, we'd appreciate it. Um, do you all, all agree that we can improve on NAFTA, understanding that the sort of do no harm principle applies from the outset? But do, do you agree that for your industry, your sector of the industry, that we could improve on NAFTA? We could enhance it in some way, some form or fashion? Yes. Yes, yes sir. Well, as I said earlier, uh, for soy, bean, soy meal, and soy oil, uh, we, we face no duties or no uh, tariffs of any kind. It's seamless. But there's always possibilities for uh, technical barriers to trade, uh, things that can come up that can it can be paperwork, red tape, uh, e-commerce and things like that weren't con sure. contemplated 23 years ago. And I think there are definitely areas where trade is taking place in different ways and different terms than it did 23 years ago as it will 10 or 20 years from now. Sure. Yes. And Mr. Frazier, the, the, the opening the uh, China market to U.S. beef, that's a big deal, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, we've had we've been locked out of the China market since 2003 when we had our first case in BSE. We believe long term it offers a great opportunity for American cattle. Beef. I think it's a big win for this administration and for our negotiator in chief to do that. 14 years not being able to enter that market, mm -hmm. largest market in the in the world. I don't know. I mean, I get it. We've got to be real sensitive to how we posture, and and the, and this president needs to be sensitive about that. But uh, I have tremendous confidence and our, our administration and our negotiator in chief to get a better deal for, for American producers and manufacturers. I, I, I think that's his heart. I think that's his intent. Um, and it's like you said, Mr. Brown, about Mexico. I think you said it. 
they're fiercely competitive and they're fierce at the negotiating table. I want American negotiators to come and negotiate from strength. I'm very sympathetic to your industry and the story you've told. I mean, cotton, that, 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 that is, uh, resonates with me because of some of the similar dynamics <laughs> with cotton in China. Um, so, I mean, I'm for all American producers having an even playing field to compete because I believe we'll win. So, um, my question is, how do, um, I, I, I've got a few points on where reforms could apply and, and enhance the, the NAFTA deal. One is reducing redundant regulations. Could you, could you highlight one redundant regulation that, uh, that would make the biggest impact on, on this deal in the positive for your, your industry? Anyone? Nope. Okay. Um, I'll have to take that up with the Farm Bureau then. Uh, that's uh, one of theirs that they listed. What about expediting transit uh, cross border? Is that an area that you could uh, we could improve on? Anybody want to talk about that? We did poll our members and ask that question, and we haven't come up with anything. But we are early in the in the. The stages, and we're going to continue to try to drill down and see if we can find areas where a trade could be more seamless. But as of today, I wasn't able to bring you any examples, Mr. Congress. Okay. Well, we got to get it right, and uh, but I think this is a great opportunity. I'm, I'm very optimistic about it, and um, but we need to hustle and we need to get it done. And all the things y'all brought up, I really appreciate it. I listen. I'm, I've learned and uh, appreciate your time very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. <coughs> Gentleman yields back. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here this morning. We uh, appreciate the perspectives you brought for each of your uh, organizations and the, uh, uh, more importantly, the producers and growers and uh, men and women behind uh, those association titles that you bring to us. They're real people and they're, uh, they're real uh, impacted. I had a conversation with uh, Secretary Ross before uh, Trade Rep uh, Lighthouser came in. I asked him point blank if the deals that were negotiated on the T TPP with respect to those countries, if we could consider that the floor of uh, any bilateral deals that we do with each of those companies, countries from Ag's perspective, and uh, that floor then he said yes, it would be the floor that negotiations from there would be better than that. And I know our production agriculture folks are excited. Uh, we've talked mostly this morning about NAFTA, but uh, the, the administration needs to be going after not only the NAFTA renegotiation, but as, as well as all of those other uh, bilateral deals that uh, uh, created the opportunity for when the administration walked away from TPP. But uh, we do have a floor there. As uh, <clears throat> Mr. Brosh mentioned, uh, bilateral deals are hard because you don't have trades you can make with other folks in a, in a better deal. So uh, looking forward to getting that done. Time is of the essence. Uh, you've heard the comments uh, over and over about the uh, impact that the anxiety over this deal being renegotiated, which is, a, is an appropriate thing to do, now, how that anxiety is affecting our trading partners and potential trading partners. So I encourage the administration to uh, push forward not only on NAFTA on an expedited time frame, but as well these bilateral deals because China is benefiting, uh, UK is benefiting, uh, EU is benefiting, benefiting from our, uh, <clears throat> our lack of a deal, excuse me, our lack of being in the, uh, uh, in the markets uh, fulsomely. So with that, I appreciate each of you being here. <clears throat> Under the rules of the committee, the record of today's hearing will remain open for 10 calendar days to receive additional material as supplemental written responses from the witnesses to any question posed by a member. This hearing is adjourned on the Committee of Agriculture is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>